All right, I call to order the Committee of the Whole of December 15th, 2022 to order. Uh, our first item of business on the agenda this evening is the approval of the December 1st, 2022 Committee of the Whole minutes. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve. All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 No abstentions. Those minutes stand approved. Uh, next item up, Law Director's Reports. Mrs. Fix. Nothing to report. Happy to answer any questions. Questions for the Law Director. All right, seeing none, we will move on to uh, the consideration of business items. We do have a number of items on the agenda this evening. I will say uh, we do have some pretty packed agenda items for uh, upcoming committee meetings this evening, too. One of the biggest priorities that we have before the council this evening is the uh, uh, budget hearings or the final budget hearings for the 2023 budget. So uh, with that being said, before I jump into the first item here, I'm just going to say that items B and C I'm just going to leave in the committee until after the first of the year because uh, I personally think that we need to make sure we give enough time this evening to the budget hearings uh, with the ultimate final reading of the, uh, the budget that might have tonight's city council meeting. So with that being said, the next we're going to go up to item A, and this is an item for performance audit discussion. Uh, I did invite, uh, back in October, I did uh, reach out to the auditor's office uh, just to get some questions answered regarding a performance audit for the city of Stowe. If, if some recall, I did engage the state auditor's office, I believe it was in 2020, obviously with the pandemic and the uncertainties of knowing where our finances come just to kind of get some information regarding performance audits. Um, now that we have a new council, I put, saw it fit uh, to bring the auditors back in to speak to this council about this to see if it's something that uh, may interest this council in pursuing. So with that said, we have two uh, members from the auditor's office here to kind of give us a brief overview of the performance audits and then uh, basically just open up the floor to questions. Every member of council did receive their proposal, uh, correct? Or we didn't receive it? Okay. So with that being said, I will turn it over to you guys want to introduce yourselves and go ahead and give a brief overview. Yes, thank you. So I'm Nicole Smith. I'm the director of the performance team um, at the Ohio Auditor State's office. I have with me today Amanda Curran, who runs our um, our local business channel, so all the municipalities, any type of township, city, um, county uh, performance audit that we might do, um, she runs that. She's also um, a Northeastern Ohio uh, gal, whereas I'm uh, Columbus-based, so um, we, ca we are kind of spread out across the state so that we can, you know, serve everyone. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to her to talk a little bit about um, generally performance audits, and then we'll open it up to questions about the proposal. Thank you. So as we mentioned, we are the Ohio Performance Team, and what is a performance audit? Um, performance audits are intended to provide elected officials and government employees with an objective third-party analysis of operations. And this can be to improve performance, reduce costs, or to make um, informed data-driven decisions, or you know, all three of those combined. We are different than a financial audit. Typically, a performance audit is more forward-focused, more forward-looking. Uh, we do use historical information, but to help uh, make data-driven conclusions that you can use to make improvements to your future operations. Uh, we can identify areas of inefficiency and ineffectiveness, um, and then ultimately we provide recommendations for improvement of performance. Um, who is the Ohio Performance Team? We were started in 1995 when our first performance audit was of the Cleveland Public School System. Um, we have over 25 years of experience. We also follow generally accepted government auditing standards. Um, we're a 40-member team. Um, again, as Nicole said, throughout the state, you kind of sprinkled all over, um, with the, our hub being in Columbus, of course. Um, we all have diverse backgrounds. Some of us have been in government for a while. We also bring in um, new, new staff members that have different levels of experience um, in the public and private sector. Again, who are our clients? Um, we also do performance audit of state agencies, boards and commissions, local governments, as Nicole mentioned, um, you know, counties, cities, townships. We do a lot of business with school districts as well, um, even other entities like park districts and libraries. We have most recently our past four or five audits that would be most similar to the city of Stowe would be the city of Hilliard. We did a fleet analysis. Um, Crawford County, we looked at their law, at the, excuse me, their landfill. Um, the city of Lorraine was a big one that we looked at their water and sewer departments. Um, you know, a couple others within the last two years, city of Finley, city of Upper Arlington, things like that. Um, but those can all be found on our website as well if anyone should want to take a peek at those. 
As far as engagement expectations, and this is a very collaborative process. Um, obviously, you are the experts having lived here, having, you know, being in charge of the city. So we want to learn as much as we can from you. Um, and then provide that collaboration back and forth to make sure that we understand all of the conditions and so that we can provide useful information for you. Um, we always re expect responsiveness to make sure that we can keep moving forward. Um, also being cognizant of all of your time as well as ours. Um, and we don't ever want there to be any surprises. So we have lots of status update meetings where we will share information with you um, along the way, what we have found so far or um, any preliminary conclusions throughout the process. Um, what are the phases of a performance audit? Um, there are three phases. There's planning is first, which is where we're typically creating um, an audit plan, determining what areas we will be looking at within the city. Um, field work is where we're doing a lot of the number crunching, the actual analysis, and then reporting is where we have the written report. Um, and that also is where the client has an opportunity to review that information and, and ensure all of the information is factually correct. And then once we get through that, that is where it will be public re publicly released. Um, all of our meetings up until the public release um, under ORC 121-22 are private auditor of states meetings. So throughout that process, the status updates and whatnot will be um, our meetings and will not be open to the public. Um, but upon release, then that will be made available to everyone. Um, we also have an exit conference, again, which is a a final opportunity to review the information and we ask for a response letter at the end. So that gives the city an opportunity to provide um, any information or feedback that they have about the audit or results of the audit accompanies our report and then the public can also view that at the same time. The timeline for our projects are typically six to nine months. Um, again, that is a lot of, the, that includes planning, field work and reporting up to release. Another thing just to mention is that a lot of our analysis is using peers. Um, we do two types of peers, typically a local peer set, which would be um, entities that are local to SCO. Um, those are typically used for things like human resources analysis, such as insurance or collective bargaining agreements, knowing that that market is different throughout the state based on location. And then we also use department or functional peers, which could be throughout the state, but we are trying to find um, entities that have a similar operation to you in order to compare you to those. And that also is a collaborative process. We will share who those peers, who we believe those peers should be and then have a back and forth to determine um, if they're appropriate or not. And then last, as far as next steps, um, you guys have the proposal that you have the ability to review. If there are any adjustments or tweaks we need to make, we are happy to have that conversation. Um, and then eventually you'll have that contract delivery and signatures to um, get us moving forward. Questions. All right, thank you. Uh, I'll open it up to members of the council uh, for questions regarding the proposal that was, or any questions from the uh, uh, from the presentation. She uh, she was speaking from a presentation. She's going to forward a copy of that over after this, and I'll forward it out to get it to the clerk, and so that it can be forwarded out to everyone. And we'll put it in the minutes for the meeting. That way, at least uh, everyone will have a point of reference when the information is being provided. So I'll go ahead and start down here, Mr. Lottermost. If you have any questions. Or um, I'm just, in general, um, what are the things that you're, you're most often asked to audit? Um, that's a good question. It, it varies widely. Um, you know, we, in our audit plan, we outline objectives, which are essentially just the questions that we're going to answer in any audit. In local government, we see a lot um, fleet, park operations, um, some, a lot of times public safety, um, staffing. Yeah, staffing. Are we appropriately staffed and, and are we, you know, are we in line salary wise? Insurance tends to be a big one because it's a big cost uh, to, to local governments. Um, and, you know, we have the ability to uh, create a, a pretty comprehensive list of, of peers and see where you're, you're at with regards to that. So um, those are, I would say, the most common things in local government. You, when you do the um, staffing, and salaries, compensate that kind of thing. Do you work with another third party? We we request the information from the local peers themselves, so it does require a, a lot of outreach and communication with with other entities once we determine who those peers will be. Um, not everyone is cooperative. Obviously, we can public records request any of that information, um, but 
you know, in return for being a peer, then, you know, they're sort of getting a bit of analysis when the report comes out as well about themselves. All right, thank you. I'll just say one, too, also, that we also use the collective bargaining agreement for some of the salary analysis, and that is obviously publicly available for the other entities, um, which gives us an, an easy comparison for some of the salary positions that are included in there. I just have a simple question about deliverables. Uh, what does that look like? So are you providing analysis and recommendations and report form and following up with a presentation? Or? Yeah. So all along the way, you'll get kind of presentations. Um, our analysis takes many forms. It, you know, a lot of times there's, you know, Excel spreadsheets, things like that, that we use to put together the data and the information. But yeah, at the end of the day, um, there will be a, a written report, um, you know, the size varies widely depending on, you know, the number of questions that we're asking in the audit, anywhere from, you know, 20 pages to 150, something like that. Um, and so all the information that we analyze during the course of the audit would be contained in that report or in the appendix. And then any of the workbooks or anything like that that we put together during the audit, should you want, want them, would be available to you or anyone else. I just have one of, you know, I know, um, thanks for, you know, coming out. One of the things that stuck out to me is, you know, obviously looking at the cost and then, you know, when we first, so everyone aware is this is kind of like the Cadillac cost. This is the Cadillac uh, uh, performance audit that's listed in this thing. And, you know, this council can still pick, pick and choose the parts and that we want to do. Um, but in terms of the recommendations and some of those cost savings that may be in there, have you ever seen where a recommendation hasn't, you know, covered the cost of the audit itself? Uh, not offhand. I know uh, for local governments, our return on investment number is, is typically seven to one. Um, obviously, there are implement, we, and we also do, we try to be conservative with our estimates, and we also factor in implementation costs. So if we tell you to do something that's going to cost money in the short term, but save money over the long term, we would factor that into our, our calculations. Um, the one thing I would say is if we if we define objectives that aren't designed to generate savings, then yes, you could be in a case where we were improving effectiveness or, or something else. But generally, if we're looking for savings opportunities, then we're finding savings opportunities. Thank you. Questions in here? Mr. Cole. Mr. Feldman. Kind of a follow-up to that. So can, can this audit be a la carte? I mean, can we pick and choose? Yes, this is, this is just a proposal. We tried to, you know, include many things that we thought you guys might be interested in, but we were perfectly able to negotiate the, you know, this thing. I will say there are some audit overhead expenditures, project management type fees, et cetera, that do make including more than one uh, scope area generally more beneficial, especially if you're like, oh, I think I want to do all of these things eventually. Um, but, um, but yes this can be tailored to, to your needs. <coughs> I know we've, I would be interested in some staffing levels and I know you have that underneath human resources. We don't even have a human resources department. I don't know how many employees we have in the city. We do have, do we know Mr. Mayor, how many employees in the city of Stowe? Uh, sorry about that, Mr. Feldman, about 274, 75 total. And HR, we have Jill Jansen, who runs our HR department. Say that again? Jill Jansen. Oh, oh yeah, okay. Yeah. So she handled the HR? Nick, Jill, and then small parts are done by Deb Benjamin. Okay. So it's mostly just listed under human resources. That's a, how we categorize anything that is related to salaries, benefits, personnel is how we categorize it. And we can do staffing levels for your entire city, or we could do it just for your finance department, or just for police and fire. Um, you, and I think down here it also mentions like staffing levels in the facilities, for example. But we could do that for any department or all of them. Great. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. McIntyre. Have you had experience? I know um, having municipal golf courses a little bit unique. Have you guys had any experience dealing with any municipal golf? courses in the past? Yes. Um, I have a few years ago with the city of Napoleon. I don't know if that rings a bell. Um, that was a few years ago I worked on that one. Um, it was also at the time I think when 
golf was really on the downswing rather than the upswing, and so they were having some struggles there that we looked at. Uh, there's probably some other examples I could come up with as well. Okay. Well, that's all I got. Thank you, Mr. McIntyre. Well, thank you. Uh, just kind of a, a finish off. In the event that, how, how does the, uh, you know, moving forward, how, how would a city formally engage the auditors if we choose to move forward with, uh, with a performance audit? So um, you guys would just need to uh, request a contract from us, so whoever the appropriate party is to do that on your behalf. Um, you know, just get back in touch with Dorinda, um, who you had been working with uh, before, and then we'll put together something and get it back out to, to you guys to um, go through your process internally. Is it, I mean, is it, I'm assuming, is it, is it similar process that the finance audit take, takes place? Yeah, our, our engagement letter looks very similar to theirs. Uh, so it's, you know, kind of the proposal that you got is sort of, a, you know, the, the guts of what we kind of dumped into the shell letter, but it's generally just a letter um, that outlines what the expectations are and, you know, how you pay us and all that kind of stuff. In any preliminary, I guess, preparation for tonight's meeting, have you come across any kind of performance audit that the auditor's office has ever done for the city of Stowe in any any form, either facilities, labor staffing, or operational, or anything like that? Are you aware of? No, I didn't see anything. Okay. Anyone else have any questions or comments? Mr. Loudermill. So from the time, how long does it typically take from the time you would issue a contract for you to actually begin? And then I see it says here six to nine months typically to it. So right now, if in January we issued a contract for that, what is there a delay to starting that, or how how quick does that process begin? Um, so I don't want to commit to a timeline until I know exactly when you guys want to have it done. Uh, I talked, Amanda and I have talked about this before. Um, that you know, I can shift around our workload internally um, to accommodate client requested work most often times I can. Um, you know, typically we can get things started and kicked off and, and worked right away. Um, but, you know, if you call us in April when we're putting together, uh, we have a pretty big season in April, um, then, yeah, you might have to wait till May. So it's, it's typically not a long delay. Is the, uh, um, if you just did the fleet, I'm assuming the fleet would be much quicker than the finance. I think the, the scope in totality will also depend on if it's six months or if it's nine months. Also, the availability of your data is a very big piece of it, too. If you are a paper-based entity or we have to, you know, come here to collect information rather than being able to do things electronically, that makes a big impact in time timeline as well. Uh, but the smaller the scope, typically, you know, the quicker you would think it would be done. And then the audit. Would you present as you completed a section of it, or would you wait till the entire thing was completed and then present it all? So we typically re issue our reports, our public-facing reports, all at once. If for some reason you needed a certain piece of the audit out for a certain management management function, we could do an interim release um, if not everything was ready yet. We have done that uh, in other circumstances when, say, they were they were going into a collective collective bargaining agreements and they needed some analysis out before that happened. Um, and that way that part was out, out and available to all of the public um, to have. So that is an option if you're up against some sort of internal deadline. For I'm just thinking about actionable items. If there's something in one part that we could start right away yeah. versus waiting another 30 days or 60 yeah. days for the whole. Well, I will say you would have that information from us th from our status meetings. A lot of clients do sort of get started on the implementation of what our recommendation is, you know, okay. going to look like um, along the way because that way in their client response letter they can say, they can tell the community, hey, they told us to do this. We knew about it three months ago. We already started on this. Okay. So, so that's one way you can you can use respond. the status updates to help. Yeah. What what low hanging fruit or what what yeah. you would want to do right. Absolutely. And some Thank sections you. move faster than others, so there could, if your fleet information is already packaged up very nicely to hand to us tomorrow, you know, we could get started on that, whereas maybe to collect information from a different department takes a little bit longer, then you're most likely going to see that information a little later in the process. But we do share it as soon as we have kind of a chunk of information available and ready and prepared to share, we share that.
further questions or comments? All right. I thank you for you know coming in and for your time and obviously council has a discussion to have in, in terms of the one if we want to you know pursue the performance audit and if so you know what the what the scope of that needs to, to look like so we can engage uh, with your office. Uh, I appreciate. Uh, like I said, if you send over that the uh, thing, I'll make sure each member of council gets it and we'll incorporate it into uh, tonight's minutes too for point of reference. Uh, but you guys, thanks for coming in. I know you don't have to stick around for the rest of our meeting. It's a pretty lengthy <laughs> meeting. So. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. All right, the next items up that we have, as I had indicated, we're going to hold uh, item B and C in committee uh, given the uh, lengthy uh, budget uh, hearings that we have later on this evening. Let's do a planning committee meeting following this. Uh, the next items that are on the uh, agenda, we have some reappointments and vacancies on various boards and commissions that the, uh, that the council took up at the last meeting. I know <clears throat> with the exception of one of these, the mayor has uh, all the applications and presentations of these candidates have been presented to council. So uh, we don't need to get into super big detail regarding these appointments, but at this point in time, I will open it up to uh, Council, if anyone has any comments or questions regarding these appointments, Mr. Harrison. Thank you, Mr. McIntyre. I just wanted to make a, uh, com comments before we get to this section. Um, as the agenda shows, several of these appointments were things that were on the council agenda last meeting. I will say I was absent from the last meeting. I had a family commitment. I was at a band concert with my daughter. I will openly share that with everyone. And instead of reaching out to me to say, hey, how do you feel about these commitments before there was a political move to put them back on the agenda without any communication, it's clearly being done to create animosity and to divide among this council and the administration. This council acts as a body. This council voted as a body. And now we're being asked to reconsider something not following council's actions. If council wants to reconsider something, there are people on this board right now that could make a motion to reconsider, but if they don't, I respect the actions that my council member has taken, and being able to put it back before us is a political move, and I'm sorry that people feel that for some reason we need to bring people back up um, instead of moving forward into what is, you know, moving forward and having enough people on these committees. Um, I know I was here when we voted on Mr. Herman previously. I'm disappointed that instead of moving forward after having more applicants that were being presented the same choice we already answered. I agree there is important business to come before our planning commission in the next several months and I'd like to see the positions filled. However, I cannot confirm an appointment that doesn't meet the qualifications. Mr. Herman is an elector of Ward 3, or is a registered elector of Ward 1 and we have a vacancy in Ward 3 which is already represented on the planning commission. So I can only speak for myself, but in reviewing the applica applicants that we had for this, Mayor Probonik, I thought Mr. Andrew um, LeBurr had wonderful qualifications. Obviously, he's an attorney. I obviously am gonna lean towards an attorney being able to understand the zoning code. If you'd like to make a recommendation for his appointment or you have another applicant that you'd like to recommend for that position, I'm sure this council would be happy to consider it this evening so planning commission can move forward. But as for the other two appointments, I'm gonna vote to uphold the authority that was taken by this council already. I'm not gonna be voting to change the outcome of something that's been asked and answered. Thank you, Mr. McIntyre. Thank you. Mr. Well, Mayor, at the, you know, to answer, do you have yes. another recommendation for the Ward 3 vacancy? No, Same but I wanna go back on this, uh, take high offense at political divide. All members were not present. Ms. Harrison, you weren't present last time. Mr. Loudermilk was not present. When it comes down to that close of a vote, and I have all people present, it's very important because it could sway a vote. So, no political divide there. In fact, today I took the time and I never have ever looked at all of our boards and commissions. There is no political divide. It's either 50-50 including nonpartisan, Democrat, Republican, there's no divide. And I've either appointed these individuals or reappointed. So if you want to look at political, <clears throat> Rich Sprungle is a Republican. Kyle Herman is a Democrat. Kerry Sudodonik is a Democrat. Rich Sprungle was on, the voters clearly voted 
three, four years ago, that they could have two terms. He's been on for a long time, but he stepped off and came back on. So if somebody's entitled to run, they have that right to do it. That being said, it could change with the, I looked at the vote count on both Kerry and also Rich, and per your request, on planning commission, Mr. Herman turned in a resume that he was actually even with planning and worked with the mayor down in Virginia. Huge, as far as they're concerned. But again, it comes up to what you want to do. And when you look at this, all I'm asking for is a vote so people know who voted for who. It's not questioning, because if the case is to be in, again, I don't want to point, but you, you, Mr. Loudermilk was absent for reasons. You were absent for reasons. They don't vote for you. Everybody should be voting independently on this council. So that's the reason why you have these in front of you today. No political divide. Thank you, Member Bonnick. I will, I will uh, to kind of piggyback on what Mr. Harrison said, in the charter under uh, you know, one of the qualifications for uh, being on the Planning Commission, one, you have to be a resident of Snow. That's one of the basic things. The other one says you have to be an elector. On November 1st, Mr. Herman submitted an application uh, to be recommended for consideration for Ward 3 of Planning Commission. At that same time, Mr. Herman attested to the Board of Elections on November 1st and cast an absentee ballot for an Oak Road address, which is in Ward 1. Therefore, as Mrs. Harrison said, being disqualified from being an elector in the ward he's seeking to represent. Mr. McIntyre, if I Mr. could. I'm, I'm, Mr. I'm, I'm speaking Mr. Bonnick right now. So. But he's a Ward 3 resident now. So when he applied, right now, he's currently registered as an elector in Ward 1. According to the Board of Elections, on November 1st, he attested to the Board of Elections. We'll let him speak after you're he done. He attested to casting a ballot for Ward 1. So I just wanted to kind of uh, make that statement. Yeah, I just Mr. Loudermilk, you had your hand up. So I just want to be clear, and I, I don't do social media, but I understand there's a lot of comments about uh, the mayor getting his pick and the mayor has the right to pick who's on the board. The mayor has a right to bring forward an appointment. The mayor doesn't have the right to put somebody on a board or commission. This system works not only in the city of Stowe, but other cities, works at the county level that way, works at the state level that way, works at the national level that way. And we can go as far as to say the Supreme Court, the president doesn't get to just pick the Supreme Court nominee he's got to be confirmed or he or she by the Senate. So these practices are put in place as a check and balance, hopefully that you get a mix of people. So nobody has a right to have their person on there. And this is done for a reason the whole way up. And um, I think that, you know, we each take a look at what we see and, you know, we heard some discussion on voting. I personally, um, you know, some of the disagreements I would hope we would have with the mayor prior, because I, quite honestly, I don't think it's fair to the candidate and to the others to air the dirty laundry, what some people may or may not think of them or think in, in the public forum that, that we would have enough applicants when requesting applications. And I know we have several in Ward 3, every time we go out for applications, we get people that are here in the city, we get requests, how do I get involved? Well, apply for these boards and commissions. And, and this has been my pet peeve for the time I'm on, as the mayor knows, you know, we have some of these long time people that have served for decades. While we have other people that would like to get involved and I've seen on some of these boards and commissions, and, and the reason for some of my votes is that these people get on there for decades and it almost kind of becomes their commission. And that's not what we want. We want commissions and board members that are gonna take the time, look at the codes, look at what their responsibility is, and their personal opinion may have some 
effect, but that shouldn't create a bias. Everybody, the goal to have these people is to have everybody treated the same and equally, no matter who you are or what you come for before the board and commission. And so I just wanted to make that statement of that and more so that, you know, the mayor and the council need to work together on that. And if they don't agree on the pick, they're probably not going to end up on that board of commission. Thank you, Mr. Lottermo. Mr. LeCount, before I get to you, I just want to I just want to clear the the air here and clear the record in terms of uh, partisanship, Democrat, Republican. Uh, I don't think there's been any member on this council in any discussion regarding any board or commission pick that has ever made a reference to why or partisanship, whether Democrat or Republican. As a matter of fact, there's only one board or commission in the city that even looks at uh, party affiliation, and we do have an appointment before the council tonight for the Civil Service Commission where it says you can't have two or more uh, of one party affiliation that serves on that board, your commission. But other than that, all the boards and commissions are, are party affiliation has nothing to do with it, nor has this council ever used that as a means to uh, either accept or reject uh, one of the recommendations that the mayor has brought forward. Uh, another. You know, another appointment that this council, you know, early on this year, the council, there's a planning commission member that didn't get reappointed. Uh, and that, that pick was brought to the council a month after his term had already started and asking for reappointment. And he was in the January meeting, you know, having this deliberating and everything else on the meeting. So uh, I know there's been talks of uh, forums are at stake and there's issues with quorum, but if the picks are brought to the council at the end of the year, the quorum issue, if there is one, hasn't been created by this council. It was created by the pick being brought to us at the end of the year. Uh, in some cases, we have boards and commissions that have 11 members. The more members you have on a board or commission, then you're gonna have quorum issues if you can't get people there. Uh, so that's one of the things. I think we have several boards or commissions that have over 10 members, at least, that are appointed to us. So I just wanted to clear the air that Republican or Democrat has never been uh, talked about at all for any board or commission pick uh, before this council. So with that being said, Mr. Lacott, you have the floor. I mean, I just find it mystifying that you can come to that conclusion and look at what happened uh, last meeting. Um, listen, when we're elected, we're elected to serve everyone. I don't serve just Democrats or just Republicans. I serve everyone. We can fight it out in a few months when it's election time, but right now um, we should be, as you say, uh, nonpartisan in this election, but when you look at uh, uh, Carrie Sewell Dolnick, who was the president, or she was the chair of that committee, and you might disagree with her politics, but you can't disagree with what she got done. I mean, she has a motor. So when we have, you know, what, three or four people vote against her, you know, and, and uh, with no explanation, uh, the logical conclusion is that you're using extracurricular uh, criteria. Uh, we should have limited authority to review what the mayor is uh, puts forward. He has the right to do that. Uh, we should verify that people live in the right place, and I think that Kyle put it on his uh, application, and uh, Kyle Herman is in Ward 3, and you are contorting yourself incredibly uh, to fight against this person that has a master's degree from Harvard's public policy school and probably more public policy experience than anybody up there. So I, I mean, he thinks you are protesting a little bit too much on that. Um, the votes were going against Democrats, okay? Um, I would bring it up, Mrs. Harrison, I'd have a motion to reconsider, but I'm not in the majority. I can't do that, okay? Um, so I find it rich that you bring this up and accuse the mayor of being partisan when the facts are obviously that you're using criteria that allows, or just say what you mean. I mean, there, there's no uh, prohibition against board members serving. Um, she meets the, I mean, Carrie Suldonik meets the requirements of residency. She did a great job. Um, you know, I, I hear what you're saying about term limits. I think it was uh, idiotic to term limit volunteers. I'm very, uh, but that's the law of the land, certainly. Um, but, you know, Rich Sprungle wasn't term limited, you know, by law. Um, we're losing a lot of institutional knowledge. We've done this already. So, I, I, you know, I question the integrity of the move um, when, when, you know, council is getting so involved in these appointments because at the end of the day, our city is losing. Uh, these are tremendous candidates with experience and backgrounds and educations. Um, and when we're playing political games, and we are playing political games, I don't believe you when you say we're not, um, it's hurting the entire city and we need to stop. We need to stop going down that path immediately. And that's all I have to say about that. Thank you, Mr. Lacott. Further questions or comments? Mr. Feldman. Thank you, Mr. McIntyre. Um, 
Can we make a motion to reconsider on the agenda as is? Typically the way a motion to reconsider under Robert's rules, the motion to reconsider uh, would have to come from somebody from the prevailing side. And I would have to, in this case, the prevailing side would have been those who had voted no. It would be my opinion. I would have to look at Robert's rules to confer that or we can uh, yield to the law director to see if that assessment is uh, the right assessment in terms of who can make the motion to reconsider. And there's nothing that says council just can't bring these appointments up for a vote. They're on the agenda, so. Yeah, I don't know why we would make a motion to reconsider when they're already on the agenda. Thank you. And they're not even appearing on it. And I think typically, I know we've had motions to reconsider in the past, and I think they've actually appeared on there for a motion to reconsider. But that was for legislation. Uh, so with that being said, uh, there is, um, there are these uh, appointments that are before the, uh, before the council this evening. So the first one is is uh, a motion to uh, reappoint uh, Kerry Suladonic to the Arts Commission for a term commencing uh, one two twenty three to one two twenty eight. Uh, all those in favor of the reappointment of Kerry, please uh, signify by saying yes. Yes. Noes. No. No. Can I have a roll call vote, please. McIntyre. No. Real? Bioka? No. Feldman? Yes. Lacotte? Yes. Harrison? No. Laudermilk? No. All right, the motion fails by a vote of four to zero. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a motion for the uh, reappointment of Rick Sprungle to the War II representative for the Planning Commission commencing uh, 1 2 23 and term ending 1 2 27. Uh, all those in favor of the reappointment signify by saying yes. 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 Noes. No. 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 Roll call vote, please. McIntyre. No. Real. Yoka. No. Feldman. Yes. Lacott. Yes. Harrison. No. Laudermill. No. All right. That motion does not carry. The next item up is. Uh, is a motion for to fill a vacancy for a term commencing its immediate vacancy, so it, but the term ends on January 2nd, 2024. Uh, that's for the uh, fill a vacancy with Kyle Herman to the Ward New Vacancy and Planning Commission. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 Noes? No. no. Roll call, please. McIntyre? No. Real? Bioka? No. Feldman? Yes. Lacott? Yes. Harrison? No. Bottom. All right, that motion does not pass. And the next item up is the Civil Service Commission for Gary Spring. Mayor Probonic, I know there was Mayor, I know there was a conversation earlier. Yeah. Uh, would you like to address that? Sure. Um, we found out uh, that uh, we cannot have more than we're gonna have, uh, we have three on this Civil Service Commission. All three cannot be of the same political party for the simple reason is we're talking about politics. This is uh, actually dictated by the state, okay? Uh, that being said though, I have Gary Spring in front of you who, like I said, is a registered Republican, uh, but he could actually do this because Sue Figler has left an empty space also. So I have two empty spaces now on civil service. So I'd like to go ahead and bring him forward. He is an attorney. I believe you, not sure if you received his resume. Uh, we did. Long time he, resident of Stowe. He currently serves, for those who don't know, he currently serves as a representative of Stowe on the Metro RTA board as well. Uh, can you, I guess I was unaware that Mrs. Figler, did she, was that a recent resignation? Mm -hmm. Yes. When, how recent is it? Today. Been? recently resigned mm -hmm. uh, was Today. that a phone call or an email written it, it was uh just delivered to me and i opened it up right before i came down okay. can you forward that to the clerk so we can have that sure to be distributed to each member of council yep uh, so with that being said obviously there's an appointment uh, uh, is there another appointment uh, we have other applicants uh so is to not leave to not leave here tonight still with a vacancy, is there any other applicant before we make uh, continue with this motion of the applicants that you would like to make a recommendation on this evening? 
No, like I said, that was Gary was my pick. There was one, two, um, for civil service. Um, civil service, unlike many, and again, it's just like the state, when I was saying, explaining the state position, uh, civil service is, and probably the law department, if you'd want, could go in more detail. But civil service uh, is, has to be very knowledgeably known. Uh, this is not something that we can just put somebody, somebody on the civil service commission and say, okay, uh, this is the case. The reason why um, I looked at Gary Spring is, of course, he's a law professor uh, at the University of Akron. Uh, 25 years with uh, Rotzel and Andrus. Uh, yes, he is a board member of the Regional Transit, but again, that isn't, that's just a representative for us. Someone li like the, um, actually the um, Health Commission is. Um, and he has total knowledge of 10 years experience with civil service on various other nonprofit boards. So very well qualified. Um, and again, looking for somebody, we have two other ones that are very good, responsible people, but he shines forth with his 10 years knowledge on civil service with other commissions, not within our city. Thank you, and, and for the, to his resume, he also served on, he's a past member of this commission as well, I think for 10 years his resume is good. So I don't think anyone's questioned his credentials, obviously it was just the one caveat. Uh, that we had so mr lavin yeah I, just one question there the so you've got a couple other applicants and didn't bring forward are you planning to go out for additional applicants we actually do have two more um she is not selected and i will go on to some more applicants because it was an advertised position just like um ward three planning was back then i could not go and put out for Ward 2 for Mr. Sprungle until after the vote tonight, uh, and those will be um, advertised because we have nobody else that we have actually in our possession that could fulfill the requirements for Ward 2 uh, planning commission. All right, uh, thank you. Is that all, Mr. Lama? Thank you. So with that being said, we have a motion. There is. Um, a motion for um, to the Civil Service Commission in light of the information that Mayor Pavonik uh, had indicated regarding a uh, another resignation from that Board of Commission. So with that being said, I see no conflict with uh, with making a motion to appoint Gary Spring to the Civil Service Commission uh, for the term commencing on 1-2-22. All those in favor of appointing Gary Spring to the Civil Service Commission signify by saying yes. 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 No's. Extensions. All right, that motion carries. Uh, with that being said, Mayor Pavonic, I know I just indicated there was another, there was two other members, if, if memory serves me correctly, that had rec or that had applied for the Civil Service Commission. And in light of the same situation, I think there was one other applicant that would in, would not be eligible under the same conditions as we went into with Mr. Spring prior to finding out about Mr. Figler. There's another applicant that in fact would be eligible that applied and like I said, it, it, instead of letting that vacancy go and putting it back out, and you already had an interested applicant, would you be willing to make a recommendation for that applicant this evening so you could have a full civil service commission? I think it was Fortunato. I believe that's correct. Just a point of order, <coughs> since that's not on the agenda for a second appointment, would that have to be done under new business with council? Well, it could be done by a motion to add it to the agenda. But I was just, okay. it was, it's really interested if, if the mayor would like, we have a vacancy yeah. that created, and if he'd be willing to make that recommendation, we could always make a motion to add it to the agenda. Okay. Um, as far as it's concerned, because I, again, always put these out to my department heads and, and the other boards of commissions, of course, we're down to one. Um, Law, do you know whether this gentleman is a Democrat? Because it, that does matter. I haven't been able to vet that, so I don't, I don't know. Okay. 
In between that time, could you find out whether he's registered that way or? If you provide the resume, I can take a look. We still have time this evening. We have executive session, sure. so if you want to vent that while we're going. I mean, it was my, it was my understanding that that, that applicant was registered as an independent, so there is no party affiliation, so it's still there for me to consider. Mr. McIntyre, point of order. Mr. Ferris. Um, Mayor Pravonik, I, I know you had other applicants as well for the Planning Commission. Again, we still have time this evening to fill the Ward 3 vacancy if you have another recommendation, either in this committee as a whole or under new business of council. I haven't looked. Uh, if you give me some time this evening, I'll see if I can come up with something. Thank you. All right. The next item up is executive session. Uh, I will make a motion to uh, recess into executive session where we will discuss the compensation of a public employee for section 121.22 G1 and collective bargaining matters for section 121.22 G4. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll. McIntyre? Yes. Rio? Yoka? Yes. Feldman? Yes. McCott? Yes. Harrison? Yes. Let him know. Yes. All right, we are in executive session.
right, uh, City Council is back from executive session where we discuss uh, the compensation of a public employee for section 121.22 G1 and collective bargaining matters for 121.22 G4. Uh, we did have one piece of legislation that came out of the executive uh, session tonight. Uh, I will, uh, I'm going to go ahead and read it by its title and in part, and then uh, we'll discuss that after that. Uh, ordinance number 22-211, an ordinance amending ordinance number 2019-95 which appointed the position of clerk of council by changing the position of clerk of council from full-time to part-time, uh, establishing the terms and compensation and declaring an emergency. Whereas ordinance number 2019-95 said in part, this appointment shall be for such term of office or until such time this council or a succeeding council shall otherwise act. And whereas this council adopted 22-53, which in part purchased peak agenda management, which has digitized public meeting management by creating an automated workflow created uniform documents and legislation, which has allowed the Office of City Council to become more efficient. And whereas prior to the purchase and implementation of peak agenda management, the method of conducting and maintaining records of public meetings within the Office of City Council was outdated and laborious, causing duplicative work, inefficiency, delay, and lack of uniformity in the process to manage and maintain meetings. And whereas with the significant improvement and efficiency in the Office of City Council and City Council meetings, this council desires to change the position of clerk of council from full-time to part-time. I would make a motion to move ordinance number 22-211 on to tonight's city council meeting under new business. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 No's, abstentions. That will appear on tonight's city council agenda under new business. All right, now comes the time for public comment for committee as a whole, should you wish to make a public comment. Please raise your hand and be recognized by the president. Uh, you'll come up to the podium, give your name and address uh, for the record. Is there anyone wishing to address the committee as a whole at this time? Yes. Carrie Sue Adolnik, uh, 4263 Meadowlark Trail. Um, obviously, you guys voted me down again for Stowe Arts Commission. Uh, I came here tonight hoping that you would find a sense of integrity, but uh, clearly I was giving you more credit than you deserve. Than do you deserve? <clears throat> I want you to know these games have to stop. Um, I've led the Arts Commission with a high level of success, and not one of you have articulated why you won't approve the mayor's appointment. Um, I've record requested the documents that you guys received by the clerk of council, and I found that a minimum of 13 people wrote in to um, <clears throat> express that you should consider my reappointment. These are my colleagues from the Arts Commission. These are business owners in Stowe. These are artists. These are people that have been professionally, uh, that have been personally benefited by the fact that I was sitting on the commission and helped them uh, where they are today. Uh, <clears throat> but of course, once again, you've chosen to lack the transparency and not read the letters that people have submitted. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and read out. Uh, the letters came from Carenza Park, Ann Garrity, Deb Rich, Tom Steffen, Charlotte Onderek, Sherry Schrengauer, uh, Kara Hansen, Teresa Scully, Tom Manusak, Ted Linden, Monica Robinson, Jess, Jess Fischel, and Faith Greer. They've all expressed the desire to have me uh, reappointed on the Arts Commission because I've been a good leader. And not one of you can say why that you think I shouldn't be there except for the political games that you keep playing. And how dare you accuse the mayor of playing political games when it's clearly happening with you guys. This is the, it, it's honestly the obstruction that happens with this council is something that I never thought I would see in Stowe. We are all supposed to work together. Shame on all of you. All right, thank you. Uh, for the record, the comments uh, that she had referenced uh, were all in the minutes that were approved by the Committee of the Whole this morning. Uh, they did get incorporated. The council rules uh, leave the uh, public comment at the discretion of the public chair for the committees and for council meetings, those who request uh, their uh, comments to be read. The council rules indicate they will be incorporated into the minutes as if being fully read. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to address the committee of the whole? Yes. Carla Brown, 3380 Sharing Cross. Thanks to the beauty of YouTube, I've spent the past couple of weeks reviewing all your meetings and motions to what all you have been working on since your election. And it seems your only goals are to usurp power from the mayor and limiting citizens' voices. 
Every issue you've raised, every charter amendment you've changed has been slowly chipping away at anyone but council having control of everything and with no accountability. No accountability since council president has decided not to have read the many comments from citizens in the record from last meeting. The way you've butchered the rules on public commentary is shameful. It's a shameful way to hide from accountability from your constituents who cannot be here in person. The system you're trying to implement is not the system the citizens voted for. Our mayor is more than a spokesperson. Our mayor is the executive branch and you're supposed to work with him and do what's best for this community, not make it your mission to strip his powers. Your only concern with his commission picks should be their qualifications, not their political affiliation, not petty revenge, and certainly not to load the bases for people that you want to run for office. These are the mayor's commissions, not councils. Whatever your personal feelings are regarding the mayor, this town loves him. He shows up for every one of them, and despite how you treat him, he'd show up for one of you too if you needed him. The citizens turned up and showed out for him, as shown with the results of issue 25 and 26. The citizens voted for Mayor Probonik to lead this city, and I have a feeling the citizens will be none too happy to find out what's been happening here. And I just want you to know, I see the petty partisan politics you're playing. I see you, we see you, and I'm gonna make sure everybody in Stowe sees you. Elections are coming. Great, thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to address council this evening? Yes. My name is Charlotte on Derrick. I live at 2919 Windsor Court. Um, I spoke a few weeks ago and since then I've been telling other people in Stowe what I witnessed, how the mayor presented some candidates for different boards and commissions that he had vetted. Also these don't get paid. So the people I've been talking to, they've been asking me why and I said, I don't know why. I said, we have certain council members that just said no. We didn't get a reason why. And then I also mentioned that I saw how a department head, Nick, wanted to offer comments after the election and he was cut off and told comments were over. Well, me as a citizen, I wanted to hear what he had to say. So now I'm figuring out, well, how can I hear what he has to say? Do I have to call him or we get a bunch of us to call the, you know, department heads and also the law director he wanted to offer and he was cut off, I, no comments. And so I thought, well, that's not right. This is a public forum. And so, you know, being a public forum, this requires civility and respect. And I did not think that there was any respect or civility in what the vice president and how she acted and spoke. You know, we are not a bunch of children and neither is the mayor. And so it, nobody needs to be talked to like that. I agree with David Lacant that I expect everything to be nonpartisan. You know, sure, you know, you might have your differences of opinion, but you know, I think to, my, to me and myself, I think you people want to take over, you want to take away his authority, and you want to appoint, and you want to be in charge of this city. And we voted for the mayor. We didn't vote for you or you to be in charge of our city. And so it seems to me, and the, other, the rest of you other ones, you're just like, yes, men. Whatever he says, you do it. Because one of you, I think it was you said yes and then no as soon as he said no. It's like you don't have minds of your own. And so I agree with everything David Lacotte said. He spoke for me perfect, perfectly, and I just want to know and mention too that obviously you want to like you want to take away our democracy and our voice. We voted like for whenever we had the dispatch center, and I you know I observed some at county council. And when the dispatch center was brought up, they said, "Oh, they said um, we don't know yet about Stowe." And I thought, "What do you mean you don't know about Stowe? We voted for it. What happened?" Well, then I heard a certain person had an objection. Like, no, we voted for it. Why is a council allowed to have an objection? And I heard, heard the police chief, the fire chief, gave justifications why they wanted it. Now we go and we, you know, have, because it was brought, maybe council should have corrected when you had a charter review, you should have corrected all this with the mayor and, and term limits and everything, but it wasn't addressed. So again, it had to go to the citizens and we voted on it. So quit taking away our voice and pushing your agenda on us. My agenda is like, you know, like the mayor and Dave and Kyle. We just want, you know, people to work together. You know, you have your differences, but don't come and talk to us like we're a bunch of children and you didn't like what was on Facebook because we will keep putting on Facebook and telling everybody to go look at YouTube 
and everybody I'm, I have a chance to, I'm telling them what I've been seeing. And I want to, I'd like to see better. Carrie, everybody, I don't know how many people have told me how much they really like what we have here. Why do you not, you, maybe you don't care about what she does, my husband doesn't, but I appreciate it. And just because you don't like it, and you still didn't give us a reason why you didn't want let her have the position. I don't buy anything that you said. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, Tom Steffen, 2272 Linwood Drive here in Stowe, a resident of Stowe for 52 years. I am a member of the Arts Commission, and I know that this whole thing that I'm about to say is basically moot. However, I do want to say it. As an active member of the Stowe community, I often attend city council meetings or view them as they're streamed live or later on on YouTube. The December 1st Committee of the Whole meeting and tonight's Committee of the Whole meeting left me scratching my head on two instances. How and why would you not confirm an Arts Commission reappointment of Carrie Sue Dolnick or a Planning Commission reappointment of Rich Sprungle? They are volunteers, counselors. They, volunteers give their expertise, their time, their leadership, willingly and wholeheartedly to a community they love. Mr. Sprungle is the Vice President of Audio Technica USA, a worldwide global organization of which he runs the entire United States of America branch. He has previously served on Planning Commission and has willingly asked to serve again, to continue to serve. Why on earth would you turn him down? no background or experience in this very important area? Hardly. What was your reason? Carrie Sue Adolnik has been a member of the Arts Commission for four years, most recently serving as chair of the commission for the last several years. Under her direction, and I'm on that, on that, I'm on that commission, so I know, under her direction, the Arts Commission has presented and or participated in many new programs. The wildly popular traffic signal box art ring a bell? Carrie. How about a women in art or the Summit County probate court art exhibits? Carrie. The fall Halloween window painting. The doughboy American flags planting. These are just a few. Dereliction of beauty? I think not. What was your reason? And then there's your holiest of holies, transparency. While you've mandated that all boards and commissions meet in council chambers in order to have accurate camera verified meetings and meeting minutes that show exactly how boards or commission members vote on particular topics, you give no reason for your no votes. That's not very transparent now, is it? Mm. It was like pulling teeth just to get the names of the council members last week, last month, last meeting, who voted against Ms. Udolnik's appointment. The last paragraph is a waste now, but I'll say it anyway. I strongly urge you to reconsider your previous no votes for the appointments of Mr. Sprungle and Ms. Udolnik. You had the opportunity to right this obvious wrong Tonight, in this beautiful season of peace and goodwill to others, would have been a perfect time. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to make a comment this evening? John and Pelizzeri, 42 Boone Avenue, Monroe Falls. And I've stood before you as well, as you know that I am one of the city councilmen of Monroe Falls. I'm here to ask you, frankly, what the heck are you guys doing? Monroe Falls basically had this type of infighting between the different political parties about seven years ago. We were on the verge of collapse, literally within six months of having to declare bankruptcy due to the dysfunction between the two political parties. If you put all of that aside, then that result ends up being, in merely five years, we're completely in the black at this point. 
we're actually more financially viable than we have been in the last 30 years because the infighting and the politics was set aside. Need another example? Take a look at Hudson. Thank the, uh, thankfully, that mayor is uh, gone thanks to his you know, ice shanty uh, prostitution ring and everything else that he's been doing. But the dysfunction up there is clear and obvious. There's one party up there that is simply based upon obstructionism, and that city is going straight in the uh, <clears throat> toilet. This type of infighting needs to stop. You people need to put the best people forward, your volunteers, the ones that want to be here, because they want to put the city first. That's the reason why they volunteered. That's the reason why they stood up. Same thing for me. I'm not a city councilman for the fame and fortune. Good God knows that $3,000 a year ain't worth it. But I do it simply because I want to make a difference and I want to make my city better. That's exactly what these other people wanted to do and we've turned them all down for political reasons. That's simply wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to address council this evening? Yes. My name is Faith Greer. I live at 4301 Stowe Road in Stowe. I am a proud graduate of Stowe High, starting my school career in 1961. I moved away for several years, but I am back and have been in the area for about a year. My husband, Mike Greer, was a proud Stowe fireman, firefighter medic, who passed away due to work-related illness, lymphoma, nine years ago. I have strong ties to this community, and it breaks my heart to see what is going on here. You say it's not political? It is. Tell these people why you don't want to vote for them. They deserve that. You don't like them? Tell them. Air that dirty laundry that you're so afraid of airing. This is disgraceful. Do the right thing. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to address council or the committee of the whole this evening? Yes, up here in the front. Hi, my name is Alana Uftograf. I live at 3505 Adeline Drive. I didn't prepare comments. I didn't intend to speak tonight, but today is my first council meeting ever. Um, I came because I wanted to understand what was going on. Um, I've never met Carrie before, I've never had a conversation with her, but I've enjoyed the programming that um, she has led the Arts Commission um, in, in providing for Stowe. I have two teenagers in the school district and um, we enjoy, I'm a transplant to Stowe, I'm different than some of these folks, um, but we enjoy living here and we appreciate our community and um, you know, from the time that the mayor knocked on my door offering me dry ice when my power went out during COVID and I had a fridge and freezer full of food that I had just bought, um, to the many small ways that he has helped and support my family um, and, and kids and, and families in this community. I, I, I came here because I, I saw talk about, about the appointments being declined and, and they're not being information being shared and, and I wanted to understand. And I'm hearing a lot of frustration and I'm hearing a lot of disappointment. Um, and I guess I too would like to put in my request to understand. Thank you. Thank you. There was a hand in the back, I believe. Yes. Thank you. My name is Kim Young, 2515 River Downs. I uh, just moved to Stowe in May and this is my first meeting. I've uh, never attended uh, and don't know most of the people here. Uh, but I moved here from Hudson and was hoping to get away from the politics and uh, the, the ice shanty and the <laughs> everything else that uh, was, was mentioned previously. And I'm kind of disappointed in my first uh, attendance here at city council and also agree with a few of the people that have said that they're should be an explanation as to why people are not getting voted when I, I didn't know the gentleman that had the masters from Harvard, uh, but he certainly sounds qualified as did uh, Carrie uh, based on the previous comments that I just heard. So uh, just find it interesting as to why there would have been a no vote for that. So hopefully future meetings will 
uh, be more enlightening. Thank you. Thank you. Is anyone else wishing to address council and student? Yes. I'm Leela Griffiths, uh, 3450 Charing Cross Drive. Um, I also own a local business, Insto, and I am the vice chair of the Arts Commission. I've worked alongside Harry for the past few years since my appointment. Um, I just want to on record that Harry is one of the few people on the Arts Commission that understands the Sunshine Laws and keeps us all in line with what we can and cannot actually do with regards to the public and helps us to understand what we need to do to move forward. She's been involved in almost every single project that we have done so far, to the point where when we, when we volunteered to host the kids patch at the farmer's market this summer, Carrie was there almost every morning, almost every Saturday throughout the entire summer. She was one of the few Arts Commission members that showed up, and she shows up all the time. So I just want that on record, that Carrie is someone that shows up and she's one of the few people who do from the Arts Commission. Thank you. Any other comments this evening? All right, seeing none, seeing that there's no other business to come before the committee to hold this evening, I will make a motion to adjourn. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 Noes, abstentions, committee to hold stands adjourned. Good evening. I'd like to call the Planning Committee meeting to order. Chairman Mario Fioca, other members of the committee are present. Uh, before you, you have the minutes of the December 1st, 2022 meeting. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 No's, abstentions. The minutes are approved. Planning Director's report. Mr. Lepo. Thank you, Chairman Fioka. Uh, I do have something to report. Uh, we went live with our online permitting, uh, permitting system uh, last week. So all permits now in the city of Stowe are to be applied to online. Um, the project itself is on time, on budget, and um, honestly, it's gone smoother than we even expected, I guess I'll say. Um, we've had great um, input from citizens being very happy that they can essentially sit in the comfort of their own house and apply for a permit and not have to come down here. They can pay their fees. It's all automatically done. <clears throat> um, and then for contractors, we've, we, we kind of expected a blowback, but we've actually had a lot of um, positive reviews. So uh, with that being said, the same is within our departments. So I think we had a lot of complaints previously about siloing of departments. This should break down a lot of silos. So we're moving forward. On top of that, we just spent 16 hours as a group going through lean training to further refine our processes that we've created, and it's been extremely beneficial, and um, we look forward to integrating that in our future endeavors. Thank you for the report. Any questions for Mr. Lepo? If I may. Mr. McIntyre. Mr. Lepo, I know obviously with the Macy's building has been moved, obviously it's being raised as, yeah. as we speak. I know there was discussions or there was rumors early on that somebody had interest in redeveloping or repurposing the existing structure, but now that it's gone, has there been any movement on the redevelopment of that property? No, so I'll just explain why the demolition of Macy's. Um, the developer, the person that owned the property, did in fact potentially have a few candidates, leasees lined up. When they went through and hired an architect to redo the facade they found out the building was in much uh, larger disrepair than they expected. They, they got, um, just to redo the roof, uh, their estimate was somewhere around a million dollars. So they went back, um, redid their pro forma, and essentially found out essentially what they had was an albatross that was sitting there. Um, just to put things in perspective, those, those big elements right as you walk in, those are solid concrete with three bar reinforcement. The estimate to, re to remove one of those is 70 grand. So um, they did the math, they figured out essentially what the other problem with it was, was outmoded. And what I mean by that is today's 
doors. I mean, anything's been standardized, right? And so they they were going to have to go through a lot of expense to basically re-standardize a building that wasn't standard. So long story short, they did the math. It was cheaper to knock it down. They probably won't be able to get a prospective tenant lined up until it is down, but we know that's that's very soon. So um, we've not heard of who that might be. We know, I made the recommendation, we're dying for good quality restaurants. Um, we expect uh, development that is high quality and fits within the plaza itself. So that's where we're at. Mr. Feldman. Mr. Chairman, I'm not on the committee. You have permission? You do, sir. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Mr. Leppo, real quick, um, being a restaurant guy, updates on Vito Brady's on tap and the one Fish Creek Plaza there with Pony Express. Yeah. He's coming in, timelines, so we have a nice audience here. Maybe sure. Can... Um, City Grill is interested in the Moe's part of um, just over there on Fish Creek. Uh, Iron Grill will be next to them where Pony Express used to be. Um, on tap, uh, we still cannot find anyone that's interested in that property. I, I have to guess that essentially it's the same story as the Macy's. So whoever's going to buy it's going to have to either spend a lot of ton of money to rehab it. And I, the question is at this point, is it cheaper to knock it down and start new? So, um, and then the other question was Bufo Brady's. I fielded a call from an Irish hub that was very interested in moving in that space and he said he was having trouble negotiating uh, a rent that he could afford um, so that's I don't know where that's at at this moment but that was a couple weeks ago so iron grill and the old Moe's those should be a go but and right now with financing and everything I, we're, we're starting to see projects fall through because of financing I, I don't expect that to occur, but um, just be aware that that can happen at any time, especially with these smaller businesses. Thank you, Mr. Leppel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move on uh, since we have a few business items this evening. Uh, a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to hold items C and D. Uh, we have a packed uh, agenda this evening outside of planning committee, and obviously we are way past 7 o'clock, so we want to keep it moving. We are going to hold item C and D until the uh, first uh, uh, committee meeting of the new year. Um, so next, uh, we will go into business item A uh, just before we get started. Uh, I know we have a few residents here that have been patiently waiting. Um, I'm sure uh, in regards wanting to make comment about uh, what is going to be discussed by the, um, during the presentation. So after uh, Mr. Kesmerski, uh, you know, gives his eight to 10 minute presentation, um, I will uh, will take comments as well uh, regarding specifically uh, the proposed development. So, without further ado, uh, we will call up uh, Mr. Kazmierski. Uh, go ahead and give your uh, name and address for the record, and sure. then the yeah. floor is yours. Uh, Dave Kazmierski. I live at 2833 North River Road. We've been there. It'll be 40 years in May. Um, on the 5th of December, I, I called the planning director's office because I wanted the audiovisual hookup for this PowerPoint presentation. And the, the uh, meeting was to be on the uh, 6th of December. And I was told that I could not present it because of sunshine laws. And I'm totally ignorant about sunshine laws. Uh, but anyway, I was told I would need a permit, I would need to pay a fee, and the uh, presentation would have to be reviewed before uh, it could be presented. And then on December 6th, uh, so we canceled the, the uh, PowerPoint presentation and it's going to be presented tonight. And then on December 6th, we had about 70 members, uh, 70 residents actually present, and about 20 got up to speak uh, about the, uh, re really against the uh, conceptual uh, development proposed by uh, uh, the Pulte Corporation. And then a council member called me that evening and said, why don't you come to the meeting tonight and present the, the PowerPoints. So that's why and, and how we got here. And I'll ask Mike Rao now to present the presentation. Before you get started, please give your name and address for the record, sir. Yeah, Mike Rao, 3281 Marsh Road. Um, so I use my clicker. All right. Uh, so there's, there's about really five, six slides that have meat on them. And, uh, and I'll go through those. 
questions, I doubt, but if we do, we can handle those as we go. City of Stowe invested time and resources uh, to create a guidance and uh, in fact hired a, a consulting company. Um, and when this initial proposal, and I'm gonna refer to it as a proposal, it's not really, it's more of a, a back of a napkin kind of drawing. Um, uh, but that's, that's what I'll be referring to. 60 plus homes, great concerns, a lot of uh, neighbors all up in arms about it. And, and we wanted to put some things on the table. Uh, it's not consistent or harmonious with the surrounding area. Uh, there's very little or no uh, preservation of natural areas or connectivity uh, as in open trails, walking, bike paths, et cetera. Uh, and I think we're all aware, you see the, the sketch to the right of, of what that layout was initially uh, presented and the uh, private residences in blue and in red next to it. Uh, that particular proposal was 60 plus homes, 62 I believe. Uh, the whole neighborhood is unanimous, so when I say whole, I'm, I'm being accurate, was uh, uh, against it, so we polled them. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is currently what it looks like, uh, very uh, beautiful pastoral scenery. Next slide. Uh, so we're really gonna be talking a lot about the comprehensive plan update, CPU. Uh, 77 uh, page plan, uh, and it's very specific in what it says, and I wanna get to those. But it ensures that the neighborhoods continue to attract investments, maintains or enhances property value and encourages walkability. So that's that connectivity part of the Stowe guidance that you have. Uh, the diagnostic report, the zoning diagnostic report. Uh, so Stowe, uh, it was published on uh, 921, but uh, apparently contracted and paid for this through ZoneCo. Uh, an 83 page report talked about, uh, they, and they reviewed this connectivity plan and, uh, and talked about how a, a guidance document, which is the CPU, uh, should be and how it makes sense to use that to do those things, to protect property values, enhance the community, and, uh, and ensure connectivity. So in that uh, CPU on page 30, uh, paragraph 4.1.1, for any new housing development located within an existing neighborhood, maintain an overall unit density that's consistent with the surrounding area. And just recall back to that, that sketch of those houses, there is nothing similar anywhere near that. In fact, maybe not even in, in the, the whole city of Stowe, but certainly not in those surrounding neighborhoods. So it violates that, that, that guidance or policy. And then if you turn the page to uh, 31 in paragraph 4.5, continue to require new standard single family developments to be designed to promote open space and recreation areas for residents with the land and improvements being privately owned, improved and maintained. These are verbatim uh, pulled from that document. And open space and recreational areas uh, were not included in that pro initial proposal. And, uh, and then if you move on, the, uh, the number one goal of the CPU, and it's stated there that future development should be compatible with the general character of Stowe, enhance the appearance of the community and be harmonious with the surrounding areas. Uh, another top goal is to continue to provide a variety of housing choices compatible with surrounding development, ensure neighborhoods continue to attract investments um, and maintain property values. Um, and you can see even the community and amenities, all, all of this is in stark contrast to what was proposed. Uh, preservation of significant natural areas. Now go, go back to that pastoral, pastoral scenes that I put up there, uh, that gets wiped out, right? So there's no significant natural area preservation at all. 
Uh, does every acre of land in the city need to be developed? Uh, no, of course not. Uh, but we do have uh, need for development and people who own property have the rights to develop. There's just a fit issue and that type of development, that type of neighborhood construction probably belongs in a, a different type of area, maybe uh, along a very busy road, uh, maybe shopping center adjacent to areas, you know, but somewhere where it fits. Uh, and I think that's what that guidance document, guidance document strives to do. So uh, the conservation of natural lands, wooded areas, uh, and, and uh, I'm part of the Urban Forestry Commission here at Stowe, and we talk a lot about trees and about uh, the environment and how, uh, in fact, we'll probably uh, enlighten you all with another presentation this year, which we always do. But trees are good for Stowe, right? It's good for property values, not only good for the environment and all those, those warm fuzzies, but it actually hard dollars. It saves on uh, pavement, saves on road work, saves on erosion. Uh, so all those things need to be taken into account, which was not done in that initial proposal. I'm assuming there's gonna be drastic changes with the next go around of what's presented. Um, let's go to the next one. So, uh, so really just to, to cap that off, uh, preceding slides demonstrated there's a lot of reasons uh, to push back against the initial proposal. Uh, and it really, um, we fall back with our logic and reasoning on Stowe's own guidance. So, and guidance that it isn't a legacy document we've dragged along at Stowe, it's something we recently paid for to be audited by uh, our consulting company. So it has some bones on, or meat on those bones. Uh, it's owned by the city and uh, we urge the planning commission to, to hear not only uh, the neighbors, you know, local citizens, but also your own document. Go back to it. Use that as real guidance. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before open it up to folks that may want to give a comment regarding this uh, uh, proposed development, uh, are there any questions from committee members? Mr. Loudermilk. Thank you, Mr. Fioka. Did, was there a slide that had the proposal or the and that and I th I know I talked with um, so in the upper oh, right there okay it doesn't show the breakdown of the lots or the well it does but area. it's so it's so small um, but if you look above the blue rectangle you see all those those small squares and rectangles. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's, it's hard to see because they're so packed in. Yeah. Okay. And, and I know, and I, I know I talked point. with um, some of your folks over there, and I believe you've reached out to the developer, and they've already agreed they would make some changes. Is that correct? Well, did, yeah, I don't, Dave's really the better one. Uh, we um, called, oh, my yeah. wife actually called Pulte, okay, they're, they're the developer, and uh, finally, uh, the fellow who spoke here, his name is uh, Jim O'Connor, and we talked with our neighbors, Jim and Cindy Goldsmith, for a couple of hours, because uh, the, our home, the blue right there is uh, the Goldsmith property, and we're the short one here, the red one, and uh, we're surrounded by these 62 homes. When we first saw this back, I think it was October, um, I decided to make some flyers and to pull the, the neighborhood. And um, I described it as a postage stamp uh, development. I, I tried to be not insulting and sort of ethical. And so uh, my wife and Cindy uh, took these flyers around and there were over 100 flyers to uh, Pamby Farms, North River Road, Marsh Road, et cetera. And um, it was unanimous. Nobody likes this. Some hate it intensely, others less intensely. Uh, but the, the feeling is that this is 
you know, really a terrible idea. And that, that's about all you can say. It, it's, it doesn't fit with anything. You know, that you, you have a uh, com uh, comprehensive plan update which says things should be in harmony and complementary. This simply uh, destroys the character of the neighborhood. And uh, so that's why, uh, you know, we were uh, opposed to this. So then uh, Mr. Uh, O'Connor uh, talked for a couple of hours and he said, well, you know, um, 62 is a lot, you know, uh, maybe we could uh, go down to 42 and uh, make the, the um, lots larger and increase the, the, you know, the cost of the homes. And he said the average home would start at $450,000 and, you know, but when you have upgrades, easily it's 10%. So uh, you're talking about 500,000. And then if you make bigger lots, you're gonna have, you know, more cost. And so uh, he admitted that and it's obvious. So, but that's where it stands right now. Um, the, just as an aside, the, the cost of mortgage rates has more than doubled in the past year. And uh, it's gonna be like cost prohibitive. You know, you can go to mortgagecalculator.com uh, and calculate, you know, what it would cost for a, a mortgage payment. And it's quite impressive. <laughs> so, um, you know, that, that's about all I have to say. Any questions or have her answer your question? I wanted to just, I wanted to keep it moving. So I wanted to say, I appreciate you coming uh -huh. this evening and I wanted to give opportunity if okay. anybody else wanted to I just wanted to make sure I answered the I question. Think, so thank you. No, I think that's it. And Nate, how many homes are allowed? Have you done the, have you looked at these and take a look and how many homes by the zoning code does it exist there would be allowed without variances or going into a, some well, type of planned development? Technically, and no one take this as this is what's proposed or expected. Technically, I mean, our max is 6 units per acre. So um, through our RFP, through, through our um, PUD process, uh, they're well within the density limits. They, they were pushing it. So their proposal fell to 2.5 units per acre. The 65 houses was exactly at 2.5 units per acre. So they were maxing out what they could with what they proposed. And that's, um, I appreciate that. And obviously I agree that uh, first gentlemen's that property owners have the right to, to do what it is, but we also have zoning codes that I believe need to be followed. And uh, going back to the last meeting, that's precisely one of the reasons I voted against one of the members. So I think we have too many uh, variations to the code that, that go through. And, and I don't think, um, necessarily all residents have been treated the same. So, but um, certainly look forward to seeing what comes forward, that something can be worked out with the residents and, and the developer, because like I said, people that, they have a right to develop the property as long as they do it per the code and don't get crazy. So. Thank you. Wanted to thank uh, for the presentation today. I will go ahead and uh, open it up to residents in the audience that uh, want to make a comment regarding this presentation. So uh, anybody wishing to come forward, please raise your hand. Um, let's start off with you. <clears throat> please give your name and address for the record. Julie Taylor, uh, 3580 Elm Road. Um, I have a question and a, um, a point. Um, the question is, um, and I'm only going by what I'd heard in the last meeting. Um, one person had mentioned that he moved out of a neighborhood that this company had built and he was lied to and um, the homes were supposed to have 25 foot trees, matching mailboxes or whatever. And that did not happen. Um, even two years later, he says drive through and it's not there. Is there something that would hold them accountable to stick to the plan they promise? Or um, would, is there a, is that a thing? Are you able to answer it, uh, Mr. Wesley? I would defer to the law department. Law department. Yeah. The six. Sorry, missed your hand. So, are you talking about Baker Glen? I don't. I don't know. He just had said, you know, they they built that and that they didn't get what they want, so they moved out. So I don't know. I wasn't 
here for the last meeting, but I do know that there was an issue with trees and trees were supposed to be put in. Pulte does put, there's a bond that if they don't do, you know, what they say that they're going to do, then they're forfeiting that bond money, which happened with the trees. So there is bond money that's... Yeah, I'm not worried about trees. I'm just worried about them keeping their word. If they're going to present a picture and we're stating our cause for that and the picture is not what we're going to get, I just want to make sure we're being informed correctly and that somebody will hold them accountable for not. I can't speak to, like, building specs or anything like that. But, you know, as a buyer of a home, if it's not what you want, then you don't have the obligation to buy it. No, I'm talking about the proposed plan of what we're going to get in our city. Oh. If that's not what you're just... If we don't get what we're describing, like this man who bought a house in that neighborhood. Can you direct your comments to counsel? Oh, I thought he was that. I don't know. So if we're not getting what is described, is there accountability? I think what she's saying is that the picture that they painted to the previous owner was that there's going to be a mailbox, there's a certain amount of trees, and that none of that took place. The mailboxes aren't there, the trees that were supposedly supposed to be planted. I guess my question is, did the city release that bond to Pulte for that development? Are they fully released of any obligation to that development? Do we know? As it relates to the bond for the trees, the bond has been forfeited. The city has that money for the trees because they did not hold up their end of the bargain on that. I guess what I'm saying is it's not the trees. I want to make sure they're there. Because I guess my point is he mentioned $450,000 homes up to $750,000. What if he gets this and he starts building and they're only $250,000 to $350,000? Is there something that will hold the design accountable? Basically, the proposed plan, are we going to get what is proposed? Is there something that holds that accountable? So I know when we're doing developments, a lot of things go through the planning commission and there's certain stages and they have to sign off on stuff. So if I could defer that question to Nate. Yeah, sure. So the final plan that's approved by council, if any reviewer gets a plan that's different than that plan, then we have to go back through the whole process with it. So the long story short is if they, the lines that are drawn on paper are actually, we call this world space, they actually have coordinates. We will ensure that if the housing and all of that is shown, it'll be built the way it's shown. Okay. And then my only last point is the, again, the safety with the one way in and one way out for the fire department, ambulances, people that are already in there, which is a lot of homes. If there's an accident out on the street, they can't get in or out and neither could an emergency vehicle in or out because I've lived through a scenario like that. So safety and keep that in mind for design. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll just tell you at this point, it is a, there is a concern within the city itself of that exact scenario and that we would like to talk to Pulte about that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any further comments regarding this presentation? I got to admit at first I was a little, there's some tension. Can you give your name and address for the record? I'm Janet Welding, 2915 North River Road. It's across the street from the wastewater management. And that was one of my things. I got three things against this development. First of all, safety there, the traffic right now is, is, is horrid. It's a cut through the Kent. It's a cut through Don Marsh Road. It's just totally busy. And then I, the other issue was a fire department getting in with the two cul-de-sacs to get in and out. That was an issue. Crowding the school district or would be Riverview. And of course they'd go to Kempton. Would they school have to redistrict to ship these kids off someplace else? Like maybe Woodland or Fish Creek. Environmentally, first was safety. And then environmentally, the upgrade will, someone has to do the upgrade to the water treatment plant because right now it is, it smells. Year round it's getting worse. And at first when my daughter lives in the house was 
the, um, we were not told about the water treatment issue, there wasn't a, an odor, would Pulte then have to disclose that if these homes here are constantly having this odor, would they have to tell them that something, if you had a water leak in your basement, there's a, would they do that? I don't know. For to, to disclose the environment there. And I think people at Canby Farms had, have mentioned that there is an issue with a, with a water treatment plant. The water runoff is an issue. Um, who fixes that right now? It's a mess. And if they put more homes in there and disturb all the land, I don't know who does that. I'm just throwing these things out. I don't know who to say or what to say, but these were some concerns. And it is not a fit for the neighborhood, as someone has previously said. said. They need to uh, extend the Canby Farm quality. And, you know, why won't they do bigger lots and bigger homes? And I can't, in the line of um, the, the financial or the finances of everybody today, how are they going to, you know, when will this development be finished? How long will that take? And they said something about having open spaces. I'm glad you brought that up about the, the, the slide proposal that you did telling us about what the rules were. Um, who takes care of those open spaces? Does Pulte always have a homeowners association? They're supposed to have li little green areas. And then they had, on the picture, you can't see it. They had two large um, ponds, if you will, for runoff water. What do they do with that? Is there a fountain put in there? What, there was these, all of these questions that came up. And someone had mentioned taking a drive-by in Talmadge and then at Baker's Glen, too. And I did do a, a drive-by, and I don't think that this particular situation is good for the area that's there. We want to keep Stowe shining, and this doesn't look like it's going to keep that part of North River Road shining. And I'm just glad it's not going to be another car wash. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, any further comments from the audience regarding the presentation? All right. Yes, ma'am. Please give your uh, name and address for the record. Cynthia Goldsmith, 2849 North River Road. Um, I'm right in the middle of this, and uh, I was contacted first because Pulte wanted to buy the back end of my property. I have livestock, and when I didn't mind that the neighbors were going to sell their land around us, I thought it was going to be something like Pamby Farms. And um, so the day that he called, my husband answered I wasn't home. I happened to drive by the Talmadge Brimfield place that they put in where it's just one house after another, no yard, nothing. And when I got home, he says, oh, Pulte called us. And I'm like, oh, no way, I don't want that in my backyard. Uh, so I didn't meet with him, but uh, we kept getting letters. I did tell the neighbor my concerns that uh, it was going to look like Talmadge. And um, so he sent me a letter, this, um, this guy was Brad, and um, he's the land developer, I guess. He sent me this letter uh, in August stating that I was misinformed of what kind of house they were gonna put in. And he said, um, I understand you visited Pulte Talmadge Reserve Community and believe Pulte would be building similar homes and that is not true. While we have yet to finalize, finalize this product type, um, we're reviewing possibilities of ranches and single family developments, similar to Baker's Glen, and um, expect the houses to be in the $400,000 range. Just like Chevys and Fords, they sell entry level cars and low price points Pulte sells entry levels like Talmadge, but this is not in our, uh, what they were proposing because they know they want the market to want to be just like Stowe and it's not economically feasible based on the cost of the land. And yet in December, the same thing was brought up that he said was not gonna be there and they didn't change anything. So um, Kazmierski's and my husband and I uh, talked 
talked with one of the representatives of Pulte, and I said, well, you know, they said they, they wanted to go ahead with this plan, and they weren't willing to, I said, can somebody buy two lots and put, you know, one house on it? And they said no, and I asked if they could make the lots bigger and have the $70,000, $700,000 houses on it, and they said no. It sounds like they had no concern for the houses surrounding this area. They were just going to go in and do what they wanted, and we just have to deal with it. I'm concerned about my livestock. I'm concerned about having like a rows of houses all around my property, and I've been there over 40 years. Why do I have to change my ways to settle for this stuff that's going in? It's not fair. It's, it's not fair to the whole neighborhood. And I, I looked them up on um, the internet, and they're not very, I mean, Better Business Bureau won't even accredit them, and all, all the reviews and stuff on them are just horrible. I wish you guys would just listen to the people and look up this company. I'm not against a development going in there. I'm just against what these guys are proposing. Just Thank take a look at stuff. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Well, like, yes, sir. Name and address for the record. My name's Doug Hay. I'm at 3324 Saratoga Boulevard, basically across the street from that. If you look at the lot sizes, three to four fit into the ones over in Pamby. Probably takes four of them to fill the lots off of Marsh Lane. It takes half of it to fill the one guy's property. It just doesn't fit in. They lied to us when they were here. They were telling us they were going to have three-car garages. The lots are only 60 foot wide. Tell me how you're going to have a three-car garage on that. They said they were going to have houses from four hundred to seven hundred thousand dollars. Not on a 60 foot wide lot. Their competition in the area, those houses go from high twos to threes. So what they come in is they put the top of the line thing that they, they build someone with bigger lots and they're trying to glamorize this thing. It just doesn't fit in. And with what you guys' rules were saying about development, there's no way that anybody can look at that and says it fits in. For these people here, it's just, it would be a tragedy if we got to them. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Kazmierski and the residents that came out this evening uh, to uh, present their concerns, you know, about this issue. And I know that this is uh, something if, uh, that uh, the council members here will take very seriously if it obviously gets to that point. But I would like to thank both of all of you this evening. And uh, we'll go ahead and uh, move on yes, to, sir. yes, sir. I know I'm not on the committee, but I Go ahead. Man. Mr. Lepo, in terms of obviously the Planning Commission meeting, I know Pulte was here to test the waters uh, to check on a PRD, and it was my understanding, obviously, that the chambers were pretty packed, standing room only. Um, so has the applicant or Pulte, have they made any, have they made any more indication whether they're going to move forward uh, with this PRD proposal or if they're going to look to be uh, building by right? And as by right, I know <coughs> it was indicated here that Pulte had said, well, we can shrink it down and do like 40 some houses, but just for clarification purposes, that 40 some houses is what they could do by right, is that correct? So they submitted a plan two days ago. We've not even had time to review it, but I, I can tell you that there's 45 homes. They are attempting to do it by right. However, um, there is an issue with the length of a road that will require a variance. Um, so I'm assuming we, we let them know that as early as possible. I'm assuming from that, even the plan that we got two days ago, I don't know. We, we're going to meet with them Monday, all of the departments, to talk things over and express our concerns per department. That's how we, it's just how we operate. Um, <clears throat> knowing that they're attempting to do it by right and the fact that they are going, may potentially need a variance, I'm expecting a change to occur, a reaction to that information. Um, but right now they, they do have a plan um, that they submitted. They've not paid for the Planning Commission, so um, it's kind of 
called in limbo, but right now it's at 45 homes. And with that, you know, they haven't paid for the planning commission. When, when would the earliest that you would anticipate that? If they do move forward with, uh, when do you anticipate so it? So our due price? date for the January 10th, I believe it's somewhere around there. Uh, the dates on I'm sorry. Um, they have five days to get that essentially on the agenda. Um, however, and I'm not trying to get in the middle of politics, I'm just gonna tell you right now, it's looking like we're gonna have to cancel that meeting because we're gonna only have two commissioners. So that will push it back to the late January meeting. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Cooper. Thank you. Mr. Feldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Real quick, uh, I, I just wanna, having been at that meeting on December 6th, and I appreciate Mr. Real was there, Councilman Real, Councilman Lacotte, um, and able to, to listen. want to thank you guys for what you've done. I think when, when you're in a neighborhood and this is how it's supposed to work, right? You communicate, you talk, you present, you, you've done everything you're supposed to do. And, and I love the comprehensive plan piece. I think I bring it up every council meeting, talk to multiple city officials about the comprehensive plan. And <laughs> thank you, Mr. <laughs> Mr. President. But I, I think um, uh, you should just be, um, I just wanna thank you for the engagement and, and bringing this forward and knowing what residents want and how it's gonna affect in those things that, um, and I had an opportunity to meet with you and, and I appreciate your preparation and your work. Um, so. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, yeah, final comment. Yeah, name and address for the record. Uh, push the uh, button on the. My name is Jackie Kazmersky. I mm -hmm. live at 2833 North River Road. I just want to know if the Planning Commission gets this proposed development, whether all of us will be notified, because uh, it's really difficult to walk a neighborhood and try to get individuals to come to meetings and they're willing to come because they don't like it as much as we don't. So I wanna know when and how soon we will be notified uh, and who will be notified. Go ahead, Mr. Lepo. Yeah, sun, so shun, sunshine laws were, were put in place just for this reason. So the reason why notifications weren't sent out previously is because it was a study item, which is kind of, a, it's an informal presentation. It's supposed to really be a discussion item. The next time they come through, it's gonna be a full proposal. Um, we will send out uh, letters, physical letters. We'll mail them um, 300, I believe the radius is 300 feet from the project itself. We will mail those letters. Um, we'll post it on our website and um, all of the posting stations that we need to. We will inform you as fast as possible. That should be um, approximately uh, two, within the window of two weeks before the meeting to one week before the meeting. But we will make sure that we mail all the letters to the residents that fall within that radius, which is what we're mandated. So it would be within two weeks. We'll get the notification. Before, before the, the meeting? meeting. Right. Yeah, somewhere in that range, yep. Um, again, uh, I would anticipate sometime in January. It's probably, it's looking like late January. Okay, thank you. And I, and then to follow up, you can sign up on updates on our planning commission page, and it, it will email you the new agendas as they come out as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Field. I, and in addition to that, should there be a variance required, there'll be additional time and notifications to the residents. No, uh, so the way our code reads is any subdivision, major subdivision has to be reviewed by commission and council. Um, if they have to add an additional variance, essentially what that does is break their ability to do it by right. So it's, th it's the same process. We'd handle it in the same meetings. It's just a hurdle that I'm going to just say that I would assume that they would like to not have. So it's just a zoning change, not a variance that requires you to post that. Um, all all meetings, the yeah, for, for the, residents. yeah, for all of the sunshine laws, it would be the same. And I believe going into the first of the year, we have the planning commission that would be on the internet for people to view if they couldn't make it to the meeting, correct? Under that legislation, it's that's scheduled to start in February to, February, give, to give the okay. time for training. But I want to, Mr. Fioka, if you don't mind. Go ahead, Mr. McIntyre. Mr. Lepo, obviously, I don't know you know, when, when it does come to planning commission, but for those listening, once, once planning commission makes their recommendation, whether they approve it 
or disapprove it, it still has to come to the council. And when it does come to the council, council has 60 days from the day they receive it to put it on for a first reading under the charter. And they have to put it on its third and final reading from no later than 90 days from its first reading. So just to kind of look at that kind of timeline, Mr. Lepo, I don't know how long it can stay in planning commission. 60 days. So it has the potential to be in planning commission for 60 days before it even makes it to planning committee, which is what we're in now, and then ultimately. But planning commission, it will come before council no matter what, whether planning commission approves or disapproves of it. Council will have the final, the final decision. So. Thank you very much. Uh, you okay, yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. Go, oh, come, can you come to the microphone? Oh, can you turn on the button, Senator Council? Yeah, Mike Rao again. The, uh, when it comes before the council, and then it, I imagine then you vote on it. it right? Once it comes, it will come before planning committee, and then, which we're in now, the committee would make their recommendation. Regardless, it's going to move on to council because it can't, under our charter, that has to move out to council. For so it moves on to council, and then it's voted on by at, council. At council, but it, uh, every, under our laws, Every, every piece of legislation uh, has, gets three readings, unless council chooses to suspend the rules on three readings and, and wants to take action on it that night. Uh, but every, it's, every legislation gets three readings, and that's, that's why I said once it comes to planning committee, essentially it could stay in planning committee for 60 days, they could move it out for a first reading, and then council has 90 days to put it on its third and final reading and take final action on it. Yeah, so the final action is a vote. Is, a, is the vote of council. And if the council says that nah, and the majority say no, what happens then? So it all depends on what the recommendation of planning commission is. If planning commission recommends in favor of it and council, for example, chooses to vote it down, it would require five votes of council to overturn the recommendation of the planning commission or vice versa. To, to go against the recommendations of the planning commission, it would automatically require five votes of council or, or, or to go with the recommendation of just the majority to uphold the recommendations of the planning commission. So I guess what I'm getting at is, is if it doesn't pass muster with the council, it goes back to a planning commission and, and the developer to make modifications and comes back again, or is it? That would be my understanding that that, that that proposal is dead and they would have to start a proposal. It, it would be, the they have, council has final say. So if council says no, um, they could technically come back with a different proposal to be heard, but essentially, I think if they hear council say no, I think they'll get the picture. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Oh, can you give your name and address again? Julie Taylor, 3580. Um, just one quick question. Um, with the new, I don't know who I'm supposed to ask. Oh, you, um, with the new um, 40 homes um, plan. Um, did he include green space like he mentioned in the last meeting that was real important? Is that in the new plan? Mr. Lepa? No, it's not. So if they go by right, what they're doing essentially is building, um, for lack of a better term, old school style residential neighborhood in our code that does not require the open space necessarily. Okay, that's back to my point where last meeting he mentioned it was really important to them when they build to put green space in their, in their um, developments. And here he's not doing it. I believe under the PRD, Mr. Lepo, they're required to provide a certain amount of green space. So I mean, it is kind of, I think, maybe misleading, but if they go the 65 home, they're required to provide a certain amount of green space under that, under that proposal, whether it be a walking trail, green space, or whatever they propose in the city would accept that, mm -hmm. that recommendation as long as it met the criteria. Is that a if it statement? meets the criteria, yeah, we would have to. But it's not in the new. Depends on what you call it. It's conceptual plan. Um, they have space for retention ponds. Whether or not what that turns into, I, it's not green space in the sense that I think you're thinking like um, mm -hmm. recreation. Right. Okay, so I just ask that the committee um, take that into consideration and, you know, make sure it is what he called it, green space for a beautiful neighborhood, uh, but a, a retention pond is not that. Make sure he's actually putting in what he says it is and not getting around the point. That's all I ask. Thank you. Mr. Lyra. Thank you, Mr. Fioka. I just want to be um, very clear, and I know we've talked about this with the residents, and when you talk about the council having the final say, 
if it's allowed by right and it meets the zoning code, even if council doesn't like it, they have a right to do what's in the code. And I think the law department can affirm that. So I just, now is the time to work with the developer and the plan, because if they come to, with us to something that meets the code, doesn't require variances or some other thing, even if the council doesn't like it, we just can't deny them the use of that property because we don't like it. So just want to make sure everybody's clear when it comes here. We do have limitations ourselves. Oh, hold on. She had her hand up, so I'm going to have her come up. Hi again, Kim Young, 2515 River Downs. Um, I just wanted to ask, based on follow up from that, um, clarification from Mr. Lepo on what the maximum is per acre. I thought he said 13. What, what could you clarify? It's, so it depends which path you go by, but the cap and stow maximum, maximum is six units per acre. Six. Okay. Now, Maybe I thought you had said 16. That's, it's that tied point. together with the zoning classification. That could occur in an R3. I don't think it can occur in an R2. We don't expect that to occur, but so, it is six is the max in all of seven. So my follow-up to that, based on, um, I live on the south side of Pandy Farms, uh, River Downs is a condo street within the development, and condos are pretty tight together, but I, I would be uh, surprised if it's six per acre. Um, the, the drawing looks very tight and, and compact, which is concerning because pulling out of Pimlico, the traffic comes flying over the hill and it's already very dangerous um, and adding that many more uh, cars and traffic going east to west and west of the road would pose a risk. And I guess my question is on the by right, um, excuse me, um, by right, could they build it, up so to six per acre? Could, that, can you clarify by right, right? If they needed no special exemption, or how many units per acre could they build today if they just came and asked for authority? That would be my concern that they could just say, okay, we, we're within the six per acre. Yeah, and, and that's and, and that would just, well, that's, that's why I say concern. buy right versus using some other mechanism. Thank you. Yeah, so um, just you. to put things in perspective, so that plan that they have there is 2.5 units per acre, so six would not be allowed to happen there. Um, now, buy right, what does that mean? Essentially, we in our code give. Well, essentially gives um, a recipe of what developers or people need to do to be able to build or develop in the city of Stowe. Uh, this actually happened at Dollar General. So um, they came in and they met every single um, line of code. They did not require a variance. A variance just means something that delineates from our line of code. Um, if they can get a plan together that meets our density requirements and size and area and lot requirements. Um, essentially what happens is if we are, if, if council were to turn them down, they could sue us in that case. Because they're gonna argue that they've met, we've done, we've done everything as a, a developer to meet all your rules. At that point, they have legal reasoning to be able to sue us saying that we're choosing not to follow our own rules. And, and as it stands today, you just stated, for our zoning, they could do two and a half units per acre. Correct? So that was with their their method of PRD. Um, it actually goes lower in a buy right plan. Okay, so that's that's why I want to make sure you don't. I don't want anybody to leave here saying we said they could do six no. per acre, and you know it's going to take more than just doing it to do it by right. It would be two and a half or less. Yeah. If if I had to guess, and this is just rough calculations from brain, it's probably down somewhere near two units per acre, which is fairly similar to Pandy Farms. Further? Go ahead. Yeah, Mike Rao. Um, so then what I presented with the CPU, what, what good is that? that? That really doesn't have teeth. That's just a guidance document. So our zoning code are laws on the books that we have to follow now. Our comprehensive plan is a forward-looking document. It's, uh, I want to use the word aspirational because it has, it's been adopted and worked on by council members, but it's a future-looking document. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't have the same bite as our code saying you shall, um, I'll put it that way. Essentially, the bite that you're referring to, uh, it doesn't have quite the bite as our zoning code. 
so this law, future lawsuit, you know, hey, we we uh, we held to the code, you know, you can't say no, but yet you're in, you're not in accord with our CPU. Uh, it, that would give it some teeth, but I'm not sure it has that listening to it. It will be, it would be part of the case. Um, it would be up to a jury or the judge to decide how much that weighs in on the decision. Okay. All right, thanks. Thank you. Any further comment? Or, or, oh, oh, go ahead. Or, Richard. Okay, do they have to change the code to put that kind of development in or not? No, so we, we offer, um, oh, it's do a way to, to preserve natural resources back 90s. Um, zoning laws, zoning laws were, were really criticized because they're, they're prescriptive, they're strict, right? And to be able to preserve um, areas of beauty or areas of uh, environmentally, it actually came, PRDs came about as, con they're, they're known as conservation development. And the idea is you have the same units per acre, but then you allow them to get scrunched closer together so that you can protect, you know, the wetlands or something like that. So that's where this came from. It's, it's built into our code. So instead of using, uh, you will have a lot 60 feet by 90 feet, um, essentially this says, which, which as an a, 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 um, output is, you know, let's just say two units per acre. What we're say, what our code says is if you're willing to protect the land, we'll allow you a 0.5 bump in acreage but we're also gonna require green space and, and, and other certain things. Does that make sense? So that, that exists in our code now. M Mr. Leffel, so, mm -hmm. I think we're getting way in the weeds and yeah. we are getting way into perspective. It could be this, it could be that. And I'll be honest with you, you're, it's getting confusing to me up here. Yeah. We're talking six, we're talking two, we're talking one. I, I think maybe we really need to wait until we actually see what they propose after you guys have met with them. Yeah. I'm not trying to put anybody off, but I think until we really see it, it's going to be difficult to put consideration to this. Yeah, but you're already saying we can't do anything about it. We don't know until we have something before us. Thank you. I'd like to thank, we're going to go ahead and move on uh, to the uh, next business items. Thank you everybody for coming in this evening on this topic. Uh, we're going to move on to item B. Um, Mr. Lepo, just, just to refresh, the applicant withdrew that. Is that correct? So there's no, okay. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion to withdraw item 22-173 from the agenda. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 No suspensions. This item has been moved to the agenda. Uh, next, we will proceed on to item E. Uh, Mr. Lepo. Avert your eyes, I'm going to go through these. 22-209. Um, the applicant is Peggy Peters, uh, 3099 Graham Road. Uh, current zoning is C3 Community Retail, and we're here for conditional use approval. Um, in case of, you can go to the next slide. High School is here, Graham Road. This is the um, intersection of Fish Creek. Uh, here's your plaza, and then this is um, Black Hawk, La Black Wolf Lounge is what, this, what a lot of us know this as. Um, the administrative review, essentially this is a 7,750 square foot building. Uh, they'll be operating as Teammate Center LLC and it's an adult uh, day support, it's adult daycare is how it's being regulated. Uh, 15 to 20 individuals, four to six staff members, open normal business hours. The company has multiple locations. Uh, no exterior alterations are being proposed. Supplementary regulations, if you go through our code, it's a big long list. And at the end it says if you're an adult daycare, none of these apply, um, so we did there. And then our comprehensive plan um, designates the property as retail service, which is what this would fall under. And this is the, I'll, I'll end here. So we're not approving a site plan, we're actually approving the use for the adult daycare, if that makes sense. Um, I believe there's a representative, Peggy Peters representative here uh, in the audience. 
I'd like to ask the applicant to come forward. Uh, please give your name and address for the record. My name is Ryan Bailey. Uh, I live in 2682 8th Street in Cuyahoga Falls. I was a resident of Stowe, so I just recently moved to Cuyahoga Falls. I've worked at Teammate <coughs> Center for over three and a half years. Um, we're looking to open this property in Stowe, right next to the high school. We're looking to um, have a connection with Stowe High School. CEO Peggy Peters worked at Stowe Mineral Falls High School. I'm sure Mr. Feldman is um, familiar with her. Um, Teammates is a great company. We provide services to adults with special needs. Um, we're looking to open this proposed uh, building, like I said, to work with Stowe Mineral Falls High School and I guess other high schools, but Stowe is where Peggy's heart was. Um, we're looking to implement independent living skills in this building, which is what we do every single day. Wake up, personal hygiene. Um, what are we gonna wear today? Do we have to take the trash out? Do we have to clean? I'm sure you guys are familiar with what independent living skills are, but to these individuals, everything's brand new. And to me, that's everything. Um, I think everyone deserves the respect and the dignity to learn something new every day, just like us. Um, like, again, I'm sorry if I'm nervous up here, but this is, like I said, this is a great company. Um, we've had all of our locations have gone well. We've grown when, since when I started, we had 12 individuals. Now we're serving over 140. So I could say that we've done pretty good for ourselves. It's not just us. We have, there's a lot of other agencies out there that have done very good with certain individuals. Um, I'm just looking at this space as this is very important. We have it in the high school for a reason. So to have it here right next to the high school, very important. So I guess, um, I do have some flyers if any of you are interested in, in these. It just goes over everything that we serve. Um, I know in the uh, slide before this, it just talked about what we would bill for and what we do here. So our main thing is ADS which is adult day support or adult day service. This is just individuals coming into our facilities, learning new things every day, going out in the community. A couple volunteer sites we go to, we go to the Natatorium in Cuyahoga Falls, we go to Salvation Army store, we go to Haven of Rest. So we like to do our part in the community. Um, a lot of companies are very respectful and accept us and we appreciate them for allowing us to come in and, and help out and do our part. Um, we also have a, uh, um, sorry. We also have another part of the company called the Crew. The Crew is for individuals who want to obtain a job one day. So this would go along with with this area as well. Uh, we have certain staff members who work directly one on one or one on four with clients. Uh, we take them to other volunteer sites that the main ADS clients don't get to go to. So this is specifically for them, just because they want to obtain a job one day. And that's our job to help them uh, fulfill that, that need or that desire that they have in their life. So for us to open this would not only benefit us, it would benefit them, benefit a lot of families. And I, can't, I can say from my part, seeing an individual come in every day, just a little bit of growth. That goes a long way with not just a staff member, but with them. So having over 50 staff and having a lot of the staff members formerly being Peggy's students at Stowe. They've seen these individuals grow up. They've known them since they've been, I can't actually say, maybe 10 to 12 years old and so on. Um, it's great, it's a great company. I can't say there's anything wrong with it, but everyone has their own opinions. So I just wanted to come up here. And again, I'm sorry if I was nervous or if I gave a bad presentation, but teammates as a whole, um, there's definitely a need for this in Stowe. So that's all I have to say. Okay. Appreciate your input yeah. this evening. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, open it up to members of the committee. Uh, I'll go ahead and start first with Mr. Latimer. Um, I just have one question on, it says adult daycare. What is the age range of these people you intend to help? So the age range, it could be from 18 to... So it truly is adults. 18 plus, yes. So, okay, yes. I was, when you talked about yes. combining the high school and I was, 
maybe getting a little confused. Yeah, so okay. our, our main focus is to kind of do pull out with the high school kids so, so that they're able to see what comes next after high school. A lot of individuals, they don't get to see what comes after that. It's just a big new transition for them. So for them to see something that's so close to them and just to give them kind of understanding of, hey, we're going to be transitioning into this, it makes it much easier for them and for them to, to go on with their and, life. And those would be high school kids that with would, disabilities that would require some kind of, I, I, you confused me a little bit. So for the high school, for the high school kids, this is more of, since it being so close, we want to have a connection with them to be able to pull them out into this facility, which would be working on, on those independent so, living skills, which they're going to be working on at high school, but this is really going to implement that into their lives. So they're not going to be doing all the education piece, even though you can consider this the education piece, if that makes sense. I don't mean to confuse you. Mr. <laughs> Wilcott. Ms. Harrison. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lepo, I, I know this is a conditional use certificate that we're approving tonight. Is there anything else that needs to be approved? No, it's just the use of adult day care. Is there anything where they have to register with the state to be approved in um, background checks for individuals there that will be staying there since it's close to the high school or using the services there? Uh, I would assume they have to have a state license. I'm not sure what that is. Um, no, we don't have something in our code, I don't believe. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. That being said, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion to move item E on to tonight's council agenda. Do you have Se a second? Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 No abstentions. This item will appear on tonight's council agenda. Uh, we come to the point of the meeting uh, uh, for public comment. Any member wishing to make uh, additional comment, uh, please step forward and give your name and address for the record, please. Mr. Daniels. <laughs> Nada. Uh, if you could turn, yep. I know, I know he knows. <laughs> so, my name is Mike Daniels. I live at four zero three eight Bishopsgate Circle. Um, so I have a question about the proposed use, um, if that's allowed for what you're asking. So I wanted to know to ensure or to ask if there will be anyone attending the daycare or allowed to attend the day or the adult daycare that has been that is a registered sex offender or a previously that has been previously adjudicated as incompetent to stand trial for anything such as that. Um, and then also, um, anyone who's been accused of any multiple times of sex type crimes or anything of that nature. That was it, just a, something to consider. If, if, is, is there a way to, I guess, ask the company to say like, no, we will not send anyone there? I know that individuals like that will increase, you know, calls to emergency services, things of that nature. So. Thank you very much. Did no law or Mr. Lepo could no, defer that one. Let the law I figured. So go ahead. It really just depends on the company's policies. Um, you know, if there are sex offenders in the neighborhood, that there are rules that they have to register. People that have been con, con or I'm sorry, accused but not convicted. Not I mean, sure. there's it, it really. It just depends on what the company's policies are. I don't, the city can't regulate how they run their, their company. Yeah, I'm only thinking, because you mentioned the high school is right there, but there's a huge daycare center, mm -hmm. catty corner from that building that no mm -hmm. one mentioned. I mean, you're talking steps right. from that building. I also, know, I, live, I live pretty close to that. I know with, <laughs> um, when people are registered sex offenders, there are rules that they have to comply with. Um, some of them include not being within a certain amount of feet of a school or things like right. that, but it's all individualized. Are those laws applicable to work? And are they applicable to individuals who would attend the adult daycare? Also, notification is one thing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Compliance or the ability to stop someone from going, I don't know, what would be 200 meters? is another, another thing. thing. So right. just something to consider. I'm, I'm just asking. I am all for the facilities. I mean, that's awesome, you know. But I just want to make sure that those things are considered. Thank you. Thank you. Any further public comment? Sir? Uh, 
Brian Dillinger, 610 Acorn. I'm going to stretch the definition of planning so that I can um, go eat dinner. There's been no communication. I think it's been about six weeks since we all formalized everything. We have yet to receive a letter. I know uh, Mayor just stepped out. Ben uh, is, is not in attendance. So I just wanted to ask, are we going to have those meetings? Are the letters going to be sent out? Understand those aren't uh, present. We can't answer that. I know. Um Idis, I know Mr. Rent's not here. Is uh, Ms. Leclerc, are you able to answer that? I know there was talk of uh, another meeting letter going out uh, regarding the restructuring of the costs. So I just didn't know if that was on the books yet. No, I do not have any information on that right now. Appreciate it. I'll be in touch. Thank, Thank you. you. Any further public comment? Seeing none, we make a motion to adjourn. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 Those abstentions, we are adjourned. Good evening. I'd like to call to order the Finance Committee meeting of December 15th, 2022, our last one of the year with a large agenda after we are very late and we have lost people all evening long. So hopefully we will move a little bit faster through this. Um, all members are present. Mr. McIntyre has stepped out for a moment, but all members of the, are, I apologize. I think we need to wait for Mr. McIntyre. I think I'm now short. We'll wait for Mr. McIntyre to return. Just wait. She's so rebellious. You can sit down to the business side and take a break from the staff side. You can sit down to the business side and take a call to the staff side. Waiting on you. Yeah. This is just the ticket.
icing on the cake there tonight. I broke the gavel. So now that we have a quorum, I'd like to call together the Finance Committee meeting of December 15th, 2022. Our first order of business is approval of the minutes from December 1st, 2022. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve. All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 No abstentions. The minutes stand approved. Uh, next item of business, Finance Director's Report. Thank you, Ms. Harrison. Uh, I'm sure we're going to have a lot of discussions going forward, so my report's going to be very short. The budget and financial report for November was distributed last week. The current bill listing for this council meeting is $2.2 million and consists of the following. Payroll in the amount of $830,000, medical and dental benefits for $469,000, park and rec refunds for $2,400, Training expenses at 6470, tax refunds at 14,000, building permit payments of $383, payment to ask me care for insurance payments of 5,000 and two OPERS payments, one for 124,000 and the second one was for the retro pay at 43,000. I have nothing else to report. Thank you, Mr. Costello. Any questions for Mr. Costello on that item? Seeing none, I'm going to take things out a little out of order. Let's start with our business items to move on to council. Item E, Mr. Brooker. Thank you, Ms. Harrison. Item E is just the authorization for the mayor to uh, basically pay our sanitary sewer bills. I would make a motion to move item E onto tonight's council agenda. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 No abstentions. That item will appear on tonight's council agenda. Item F and J, Chief Stone. Thank you, Mrs. Harrison. I'll be brief. Uh, item F is uh, we've spent all of our funds that we have uh, allocated for Claven for repairs of our ambulances. We've had a transmission go out and brakes go out, so it put us over the our budget. We need some more funds to uh, finish up there. And then the other item would be uh, the 10 sets of fire gear that we had budgeted for the 2022 uh, capital budget. So we're just now finally getting our bids in and getting that rolling. So uh, we're, we're late to the game on that, but that's what we are with that. Uh, that was part of our uh, approved budget for this year. It will be next year before we receive the gear. I'm pretty sure. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions on item F or item J? Seeing none, I'd make a motion to move items F and J onto tonight's council agenda. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 No abstentions. Those items will appear on tonight's agenda. Item G, I believe this is for the finance department. Sorry, I didn't hear which issues. I'm sorry. Item G, please. I believe they all go together, right? Yes. Okay. Um, well, G and, uh, G and H, too. Okay. Uh, G and H are both uh, closeout items for the uh, uh, one for the appropriations, one for the cash. Make sure the balance and all accounts are covered for the year. It's something we do every year at the end of the year. It doesn't involve any new expenditures, just making sure all accounts are covered and the budget remains balanced, both for appropriation and cash. That's uh, 204 and 205. For, for those items, Mr. Earl, do either of those include the monies that we talked about moving from the COVID or from the ARPA funds into no. other funds? Is that included in this? No. That is in the separate piece of legislation? That's separate piece of legislation still. Okay. And that's before council already? Yes. Are there any questions from the members of committee about items G and items H? I just one, will Mr. we McIntyre? Just, just for the purposes of taking, uh, for our clerk's taking a minute, <coughs> if you could take the motions on each item separately so they can capture the the, the moves and seconds on the financial report, please. Thank you, Mr. McIntyre. I would like to make a motion to move item G onto tonight's council agenda. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor, please signify by saying yes. 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 No's, abstentions. That'll appear on tonight's council agenda. I'd like to make a motion to move item H onto tonight's council agenda. Second. Been moved and seconded. All those in favor, please signify by saying yes. 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 No's, abstentions. That'll appear on tonight's agenda. Uh, item I, Mr. Earl. Item I is to uh, amend the amount of the required contribution to the health plan uh, by employees that are covered by the plan. Uh, the family rate would increase from $235 a month 
the 255 in 2023 and 275 in 2024. The single rate is exactly half of the family rate. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Earl on item I? Seeing none, I'd make a motion to move item I onto tonight's council agenda. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 No abstentions. Items I will appear on tonight's council agenda. We will now move up to our final, some of our final business items related to our budget. Mr. Brooker, I'm going to make you wait since Mr. Jones has patiently waited all night. I will let him go first. Thank you, Ms. Harrison. I thought everybody was here for the stormwater presentation, but it seems like they carried out. We're going to start by beginning with the stormwater improvement projects for 2022 and 2023. We're going to go over the completed projects in 2022. Project under construction. And then we'll go through the planned projects for 2023. We'll begin with the completed projects in 2022. We'll start with, uh, oh, just in some housekeeping items for the slides. I always put the district and the ward. The project is in the upper left and the project cost will be on the upper right. Uh, we'll start with Green Tree Road, storm sewer improvements uh, located 3900, 3901 Green Tree. It included the removal of 530 linear feet of deteriorated corrugated metal pipe, and it was replaced with 440 linear feet of 60 inch HP pipe, two full height head walls. Next, we're gonna move on to North River Road reconstruction. Uh, this was located at North River Road, west of Surrey Hill Lane, and include the removal of 450 linear feet of deteriorated corrugated metal pipe, Installation of 760 linear feet of 24 inch HP pipe along the south side of North River Road and the regrading of the roadside ditch. In the picture below on the left side, you can see the existing uh, 24 inch corrugated metal pipe that was heavily eroded and uh, heavily deteriorated. And the picture just to the right of that is kind of before and after. We'll move to Lakeview Highland Detention Basin located uh, in front of Lakeview Highland Schools. Includes installation of two detention basins and various storm sewers in front of Lakeview Intermediate School. Moving on to miscellaneous storm sewer lining. Uh, first location was off of Kingsdale Drive. It included 238 linear, a 32-inch pipe uh, for 2037 Kingsdale Drive. And then the second location was off of Timberdale Drive. I had 307 linear feet of 24 inch pipe lining, 100 feet of 15 inch, as well as 15 inch uh, CIPP lining as well. Uh, the left picture shows an installation method to, for the 24 inch off of Timberdale. Uh, it was a tricky area, so we needed to put a temporary construction drive. They needed to use uh, that forklift to insert the liner. Uh, the middle picture is kind of when they bake the line. So after a liner is installed, uh, they put you know, basically hot steam into that liner for a period of time until it hardens. And then we have the 42 inch liner coming out of the bed of the truck there, far right. Miscellaneous storm sewer repair project. This is a series of projects. Project 1, 28-2, Arndale. We removed old and damaged infrastructure, replaced it with new drain system, French drain combo. Project two was 3966 Mr. Leewood. Jones, I was gonna say, I think your slides are a little bit behind you there. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. It, it seems like there's a lag. It was right now on the, I'm on Leewood, but it's not showing Leewood. Apologize. Uh, 3966 Leewood erosion repair, place various amounts, type C and B rock channel protection along the bottom of the side slopes of existing stream to correct a major head cut within the stream bed. While we're waiting, Mr. Jones, the Leewood, that was kind of an unexpected one that came up, correct? Correct. Thank you. Uh, moving on to Project 3, Silvercrest Basin Headwall Repair. Installed a cutoff wall extension, uh, extension on the existing footer of the 60-inch full-height headwall that 
uh, enters into Silvercrest Basin to eliminate the scour under the footer. I didn't get a good picture of the actual scour, but if you look at that first uh, picture on the left, if you look past the plywood underneath that footer, there was probably like a three foot scour underneath the uh, footer there, so that was corrected. On to miscellaneous uh, project number four, 2984 Foxborough headwall repair. Include the removal of an existing headwall that was falling over and we replaced it with a new ODOT standard full wipe headwall for that 27 inch pipe. Go over real quick project under construction. Currently, District 1 trunk storm sewer replacement located in the rear yards of the 2142 Graham Road and ending in a new junction chamber uh, for the Mar Hopper detention basin. Includes removal of 530 linear feet of <coughs> deteriorated 81 inch by 59 inch corrugated metal replacing with 530 linear feet of the same size but aluminized corrugated metal pipe. Okay, moving on to the plan, it'll go back, I'm sorry, there's a lag in the, moving on to the plan projects for 2023. Sharon Cross Storm Sewer Improvement, located Sharon Cross Drive from 20, or from 3426 to 3401, includes installation of 42 inch HP storm sewer, which is gonna be in the red. The purple is our existing storm sewer. Uh, and which, so right now it's currently dual 10 inch pipes behind 3426 transitioning into 24 inch along Sharon Cross. We will be replacing that with 42 inch, like I said, basically from the top star to the bottom star and the new storm sewer be the red. Arndale Ditch Improvements in the rear yards from 1745 to 1805 Arndale Road. Uh, the overviews construct an open channel ditch with a series of culverts in the rear yard to direct alleviate surface runoff that causes flooding to the residents along Arndale Road. Next project will be 2425 Silver Springs Drive. But this project is located between 2425 and 2415 Silver Springs Drive. The uh, project will install concrete erosion control matting to prevent aggressive scour and ditch line erosion, as well as install a series of culverts under the bike and hike trail to alleviate flooding encroachment into the nearby properties. So the blue line will be where the concrete erosion control matting will be installed, and the, th the series of three red lines are going to be the uh, proposed culverts under the bike trail. And then we just put the uh, flex mat brochure picture of what those concrete matting looks like on the right hand side. Mr. Jones, you know I'm going to ask about this one because we've talked about this one at length. Uh, is this now approved by the Summit Metro Parks? Correct. Okay, thank you. Is that what the culvert, is it going to be a box culvert like that or is that just the picture for the matting? Picture for the matting. <clears throat> Moving on to Meadowbrook Lake study. Uh, location, Meadowbrook Lake. Uh, the overview, Meadowbrook Lake, which is a city owned, is located in the northwestern portion of the city of Stowe. It feeds and is feeding Powers Brook near the intersection of Hutchin Drive and Norton Road. Uh, it's one of the largest lakes in, within the city, approximately 23 acres. Meadowbrook Lake Conservation is an item the city of Stowe would like to investigate. Uh, study is being completed in order to find different ways that we can continue the conservation efforts for the lake. The study will include uh, remediation options of erosion repair, vegetation and wildlife consideration, creative recreation amenities, flood analysis, as well as dredging options. And finally, uh, Forest Hill Storm Sewer Upgrade, uh, the engineering. So this is located from 4424 to 4526 Forest Hill. Um, we will prepare plan, design plans for the upsizing the existing storm sewer along the south side of the roadway. From 4424 to 4526 Forest Hill, storm sewer replacement will mitigate the roadway flooding within Forest Hill Road, as well as alleviate the flooding between 4432 and 4424 Forest Hill, which is just east of Briar Road. And that concludes the stormwater presentation for this evening. Happy to answer any questions. I'm going to steal my friend's list next to me real quick. Um, there was one item you didn't mention on here, Mr. Jones, I, for Norton Road storm, ro storm uh, improvement. Is that still on the list for 2023? <clears throat> we're still, we're currently working through uh, design alternate alternatives for that project. Um, it seems to be a difficult challenge working um, with design alternatives as well as working with uh, the city of Hudson on, on some design options. So uh, that is still a possibility. Um, 
just didn't want to put on the presentation tonight. Thank you. And can you please email your presentation to the clerk's counsel so they may add it to the minutes? Absolutely. Any other questions for Mr. Jones? Mr. Feldman. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Harrison. Uh, so eight and nine aren't up here. Are they on the list? Berkshire, Darrow, Darrow, Hibbard. I didn't see Meadowbrook. I, I saw Meadowbrook up here, but I don't see it on the list. That was I don't either. Mr. Jones, are you aware of the list that we're referring to? Yes. Okay. So, uh, 1439 Berkshire acquisition. Yes. And Darrow Hibbard, 48 inch storm sewer replacement. Correct. Uh, so, 1439 uh, Berkshire acquisition is still something we would heavily like to look into. Um, still haven't made the final leaps to look into the process of acquiring that property. So, uh, we're not looking at this. At the, we're not looking at that property at this time. And then nine. Nine, uh, nine. Um, we are going to look to include and incorporate this project into the 91 reconstruction project. It's within the corridor, and we are with the uh, sidewalk installation on that side and what's required for grading purposes. We felt that we could lump this into that project um, during that time. I'll ask comment, Ms. Harrison. I just want to uh, thank you. I, I, I talked to the resident on Leewood, and you know, government, we're slow. But we were pretty fast on that one. And he was concerned about that repair, and I thought we moved pretty good on that. So um, congratulations on, on that Leewood repair. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Harrison. Thank you, Mr. Feldman. Mr. McIntyre? I just wanted to thank, you know, obviously, uh, Green Tree was a big project. I know that was a long time coming. I know myself, Mayor Pavonic, and Mario, and Mayor, if you recall, Labor Day of 2020, the storm, I mean, the water was over our knees, and these residents were, you know, trying to keep it from going into their houses, and with that much water, and this is, that overall improvement is going to be a, you know, when, the ne when that next, I think that storm with probably close to a 100-year storm comes, that, that that issue will, we won't see that problem over there, so I, I know there were some hurdles with some sanitary there were some hurdles with some utility relocations but obviously you guys worked through that got that done and, <clears throat> and the project is done have they repaved the road since too i know it was on the if they have okay that's all i had thank you thank you any further questions mr real sure um just a question about the uh, mar hopper so uh, that's in a notoriously bad area for storm water fear by residents that their basements would be flooded or, or sewage backed up. So um, multiple years ago, we undertook a big project to buy homes over there, um, tear them down, I believe to make it contingent bonds. Um, I believe one or you know, two homeowners said no at the time. Um, I, so I guess my question is, is that in, in the scope of the project, like what's left to do? I know that was a big undertaking. Um, are we still on the lookout for those properties? Uh, you know, if they decide to put them up, uh, you know, what, what are we looking at over there? Because it is a notorious area and, uh, uh, when it comes to storm water and I know it was a big project. Uh, I would say yes, we are still, um, we would still be interested in those properties that would allow us to construct the detention basin to its full capacity. Uh, right now we're working on replacing the old corrugated metal pipe that um, is 30 plus years old and it's deteriorating. So right now we're kind of from the head wall coming south of Graham Road to the basin, it's kind of the section we're working on. Our goal is to continue all the way down to Kent Road uh, in the future. Yeah. I mean, just for the listening audience, Ward One and those areas, Oak Road, Williamson, Mar Hopper, um, those were those were always uh, areas that were hit terribly um, by 100-year floods and sewage backups, and that's where we were. Any further questions, Mr. Laudermill? So on the Berkshire, I assume that was to do similar to Mar Hopper, some type of retention or detention. Mason, is that correct? We haven't kind of gotten into those details. Uh, I don't feel the property, just this single property, would allow us to put any kind of detention that would help alleviate the flooding. Um, this this property is just within um, an area that that similar to these areas, cease flooding on multiple occasions. So it was kind of a, a wish list to acquire to eliminate a resident from flooding multiple times. And so 
in the meantime, what are we, what do we have in the books, or what are we doing to help with that flooding currently? Uh, continue. I mean, it has, that has a large storm sewer system that runs between this property. We continue to monitor for any block, you know, any block. It's got a large head or a catch basin, but it's got a large opening. So continue to monitor for anything that might be impeding or blocking that system. Was that typically the flooding was uh, 50 or 100 year, or was it less than that? Do you recall? Just I I don't recall. I, I would say it close to once, not if not twice a year. Once I know it last year we did have some impact flooding to that property um, that the resident contacted me about, okay. and it, at least twice a year it gets closed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lauderville. Any further questions for Mr. Jones? Mr. McCleary, do you have anything to add on that? No, I think um, Michael has done a great job on the stormwater projects this year, and we look forward to doing many more next year. Thank you. Mr. Jones, we'll make you not talk as fast next year. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I appreciate that and going over those projects um, and, and look forward to the ones that we can get completed in 2023. Mr. Brooker, I think we'll start up at the top about item A, Parks and Recreation Capital Projects discussion. Thank you, Ms. Harrison. Um, basically for Parks and Rec, uh, if you have any specific questions today, uh, I, again, Mr. Wren, apologize for not being here. This one was kind of added to my agenda and I haven't really studied that much. If you have any specific questions about any of the Park and Rec stuff, Ms. Narstat would be more than happy to answer them for you. Um, so I will open that one up to questions, please. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Nurse said, is this something that you're working through with the Parks Board too to kind of prioritize the yeah. projects for 2023? And I know we've kind of tasked them with looking at, hey, we have the Parks Master Plan now. What's our five-year plan? What are some of the things? Is this something that they're working through? Yes. In fact, I wanted to update Council on that. Um, this project was is a compilation of Mr. Ren, Mr. Anderson, and myself. Um, the Parks Board entertained the list at their November meeting. And they voted to approve it and they are advisory in capacity so we'll keep that in mind um, at uh, the December meeting we had a lot of discussion um, and they did discuss prioritizing the list that was the focus of the work session in December this, this past month and um, they they decided that they would um, go through a prioritization process they're going to do it individually on a form provided by one of the members and then collectively we'll come together at the January meeting and merge the individual's priority list together and of course you'll have input from Mr. Anderson and, and Mr. Wren on those projects um, and I can say just from you know the parks board's point of view and being in tune to the master plan we know there are a lot of items that need to uh, be upgraded or improved that aren't a part of that plan or lodges and so on and things that we should be need to be doing every year um, so we need to keep that on the list too while we're talking about these uh, master plan projects one of the items that has risen to the top with many of the members is the wayfinding project that's on this list um, we thought to feel like it would be um, something that was noticed by the community and an early win be happy to answer any questions yeah I, I know there's a couple items on this list that were maybe carry I were carryover items from this past year that we didn't get to I know we did a lot of new things this past year um, it seemed like there was a lot of visionary kind of things on this list where I know we still have a lot of those critical improvements that were still on the parks master plan that maybe weren't here so I guess my preference would be to see where the parks board feels on that that, that we address some of those critical items before we start branching into the visionary things because we still do have a lot of parks that need maintenance and I know we've talked about you know we, we did a lot last year council administration for as much as people say we don't work together if you go around to our parks I think you would disagree there's been a lot of good collaboration working towards investing in our parks and improving and replacing equipment that needed replaced um, so I guess that was just my thought when I looked at this list that there seemed to be um, more of the visionary things I did like that we're continuing to replace some of the playground equipment. I think a lot of our playground equipment has gotten to the end of life. I think for a long time, we've asked Mr. Anderson to replace pieces and replace parts. And I think 
we finally have realized we can't keep doing that forever and it's time to, to make some of those changes. So I'm, I'm glad to see some of that done here. Um, that's all I have on the parks. I don't know if anybody else on the committee has any questions. Mr. McIntyre. Thank you. Looking at some of these items, for example, the campground, uh, and I know these are listed here as separate items and I think sometimes, uh, and this is a question maybe for Mr. Wren or Mr. Brooker, uh, are we gonna, is it, is it the intent to sell these items as individual items with the exception of site design and engineering, obviously those are two different things, but the actual construction of some of these items as opposed to selling it as, I can't imagine that there's not a general contractor that can't come in and install pads, dump station, and electric water and storm. I mean, and, and you may be showing them as just here's these little projects, but is it the intent to sell them as individual projects as opposed to one big project, say, to, for the benefit of getting a better cost? Well, some of the projects that he has listed here, these are if we have to go out to full price. Um, we do, as we know, there's tons of things the city does in-house. Um, take, for example, all the prep work and all the electric work and everything we've done recently at Skip Playground and uh, the amphitheater parking lot. We save tons of money by the city utilizing the skills of our employees. We envision doing a lot of this, even though it's in the budget. These are dollar amounts that we're showing that Worst case scenario, if we have to go out and break these things up and spend a little time, this is what we're going to spend. A lot of things we can do in-house. We do have the, um, a lot of good employees that have the know-how and the knowledge to help us. We have a great electrician. We have excellent guys doing stormwater work who can help with some of the drainage. So a lot of these items, even though they are in here and broke down, this is worst case scenario. Okay. And as far as like what, what department would be performing this type of doing this? You work? name it. Every department and uh, service uh, department, it'll be street, water, parks, building maintenance. We all work together. Okay. Is there, I mean, is there any reason, I guess, why? I mean, I'm going to use this as an example. Adele Durbin sat at the council approved it in December of 2020, and the material was delivered in June of 2021. And we just got to the point where we finally said, our forces can't do it. We have to go out and get a contractor to do it. Is that, that's, is that true? Some of the items that uh, I'm referring to, we will be doing in-house. Some of the items we will be contracting. Uh, as far as the Bell Durbin, a lot of that had to do with the county and what we were able to do and the elevations we could get to make the sewer work. We don't do sewer work. We won't dig deep. We don't have the equipment to dig deep or the manpower to do that kind of thing. Any of the smaller stuff in-house, we will take care of it at our, uh, that we can handle. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brooker. Thank you. Mr. Feldman. Thank you, Ms. Harrison. So, Mr. Narstead, real quick. So, the Parks Board approved this listing in, in November, correct? Correct. And they're going to kind of go back in December and, and prioritize, correct? Correct. Okay. I, I like the idea. As, uh, as a council, we empowered them. Um, and uh, I like those, that group um, that's working together and, and making some of these I guess finding that balance and to, to comment on Mr. Brooker, let's get things done, right? We got to find that balance of, oh, we can save money or are we sitting here looking at a bathroom that's not done three years later, right? So, I mean, I, I like the campground improvements, the disc golf, the heritage barn. I mean, there's a lot of good stuff on here, but man, it'd be nice to check it off like we did it, right? Instead of going, and I appreciate Mr. Jones, but you know, ones that aren't done, you know, it helps when we can get them done, right? I just, I, and I think finding that balance of saving money or contracting out, I, I think is important, right? How do, how do we, how do we get it done so we don't look like we're inept as a city and a council and an administration and a, by, by not getting things that we approve, discuss, talk, and, and get done, so. Uh, that's not a criticism. I just think that's a, a thought of when you represent residents, they lo I love these little victories because they see them. Even a sidewalk across from Woodland, I told Mr. Wren, victory, right? Wasn't very much. We got it done. But residents notice those things. So I'm all for making residents say, wow, that's nice, right? So tell the Parks Board, good job. Thank you, Ms. Harrison. <laughs> Time, you, time sometimes is more valuable than the money you're saving by doing it in-house, I guess, to piggyback off what you said, Mr. Feldman. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Mr. Real? There's just a question about the Adele Durbin. Mr. Real, microphone, please. Uh, 
voice is not loud enough. Are you kidding me? <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so Adele Durbin, the Adventure Challenge course, it says, in, you know, engage with a private entity. What does that mean? Are we seeking sponsorships? Or, yeah, what, what, um, what, what if you're mean? familiar at all with Go Ape, and there's another company, I don't know if you're familiar, you might not be, um, there is one in Strongsville, but a company provides that. So they would come in and build an Adele Durbin and run it, and then it could potentially be a revenue, a source of revenue. We have a long way to go to look into it and see, see how it works. Still yeah, the um, going to Adele Durbin quick. The observation deck is that the Eagle Scout project that was done to restore that observation deck. No. What's the status of is this? Right? I'm not. I'm not aware one? of that. But this, it, this, the one listed in here is not that. I'm not aware of the, an Eagle Scout project out there. Being done. Okay, years ago there was a, yeah, I think an observation deck built out there. Uh, one that's already built. Yes, there is, and this isn't that. Okay. The um, other thing I guess I would look at, and uh, to go to Mrs. Harrison's point, um, kind of a wish list. You know, we recommended the mayor go out for six hundred fifty thousand dollars to build a playground. I can tell you right now, I for one am not going to be in the yes column for an eight hundred fifty thousand dollar splash pad when we have all these other things to do, and on top of that, roads in general come out of the capital fund. So, um, yeah, hopefully we'll get these. And Mr. Booker, I would hope that any of these that we can group together to Mr. McIntyre's point and get them contracted out and get them done quicker, um, I would certainly hope we look at doing that. Yeah, we'll, we'll definitely be looking at everything in general. So, yeah, I would like some stuff to get done that we don't have to put on all of our guys, too. Any further items um, on item A for the parks improvements? Seeing none, item C, Mr. Brooker, I believe this is the uh, safety and service equipment summary. Thank you, Ms. Harrison. List. Okay, so this year um, we put our total list together. Out of the list, there's only four new pieces of equipment, 20 are all replacements. To give you a quick, uh, just to go through it real quick, I'm not going to go through it line by line. I'll let you guys ask questions, whatever you want to ask about. But out of the 20 pieces of, uh, of replacement equipment, again, we will be moving vehicles around as we see fit from department to department to, to the best needs. The average age of equipment in the service department that we're asking for replacement is 18 and a half years old. The police department equipment, of course, is a little newer, but as we know, um, the cruisers put a lot of miles on, a lot of use, and then we repurpose them for many, many years to come. Um, we still have a couple Crown Vicks, believe it or not, rusting out in the parking lot, but they are used. Um, so with that being said, the only four new pieces of equipment that I have on here I'll touch on. Um, number seven is something we're looking at for future. It's something that would have to be uh, ordered, built, and that's to help with the preservation of the concrete. As you notice, everybody knows our concrete out front um, takes a beating in the winter. We're looking at more of a snowblower type unit to clean the concrete off so we're not actually plowing it off and using as much salt. Um, and that's not just with out front here, that would be also with the new skip playground, trying to keep the damage down. The other things, um, there's one new pickup truck in the budget for engineering, that's not a replacement. Reason being is, as we know for years, engineering was down on their people. They finally got people up to a decent status and they don't have enough vehicles for their, um, their personnel. They are using some of the old LEAF vehicles right now too. Uh, we're just trying to get them the equipment they need to perform their job properly. The other two new, event, um, new items on the list are the event generator. Every year we are constantly renting generators for events such as Summer Sunset Blast, any of the other big parks projects, it'd be nice to have an actual generator that we can use and not have to rent all the time. And then the very last thing is uh, number 24. That's the remote hillside mower. Uh, it's not just a small mower. This thing weighs like 2,400 pounds. We've been looking at this for years, and now that ODOT finished up with Route 8, we know the maintenance is back to us. A lot of people don't understand Route 8 is basically a city street once it's done. Thank you very much. Go ahead and maintain it, clean it, mow it. It is one of the most dangerous places for our employees to be. We have to mow it on a regular basis to try to keep it looking good. 
and with the new slopes that ODOT put in for us, um, they're not safe to ride a mower on. So we have looked into this. That mower um, is a remote control unit. We'll come with a little trailer that has to go on because again, it's about 2,500 pounds and that'll ensure the safety of our uh, personnel for not having to worry about rolling over on a tractor out on Route 8. Um, other than that, everything else is again replacement and I'd be happy to answer as many questions as I can from you tonight with the time we have. Mr. Brooker, this seems like a very lengthy list and appetite <laughs> for what is available in the marketplace as it comes to supply and demand of this type of equipment. I, I what a, are the likelihoods that we get half of it? So I've had multiple discussions. I know the police and fire have been doing their due diligence um, in trying to secure equipment also. Uh, I talked to Ford, GM, Chrysler, all the order banks were closed. So basically what we're looking at is whatever we order this year, we're starting to realize that it's not like the old days. We don't order it in April and we see it in June, July, August, September. We're gonna order it as soon as we can. They will put it, when that day opens up and the GM or Ford or Chrysler, whoever we get the best price from says, the vehicles are available, you have to order it. You have to have the money ready and you have to have a PO in place. Um, last, was it November, GM opened up for two days to government entities. There's not many governments I know that have a PO in place the year ahead of time and they can just say, oh yeah, here, here's $100,000, order me two trucks. So we really need to come up with a plan. We're, that's what these prices are, they're a plan. Um, Hanley Chevrolet, who's been providing pickups for the last couple of years, has indeed come up with, yeah, if you order them, I will make sure I get them in for you. It may be November, December, or it could be January, but we have to start getting that new cycle of ordering a truck this year and realizing it'll be here next year. It's almost kind of like the fire truck scenario. Order here, I'll see you in two years. Um, the only thing that we haven't had a problem with so far has been our large equipment. Um, some of the large equipment, the dump trucks, for instance, they've always taken a year to build. Um, Freightliner has been great. They actually call me every year and say, how many are you looking for? I say, wish list is two. He says, I'm putting them in. I said, I don't have a PO. He says, you know what, City of Stowe has been good to me. I'm gonna reserve a spot. So we've been really lucky with that kind of stuff. I have, um, with two trucks being on here, the internationals this year, he's already placed an order to hold for us for next year, or for this year to be built. So we have a good relationship. I'm trying to keep that relationship with these dealers as much as we can, but yes, it's, it's tough. It's tough getting this equipment in. We've done well, we've been really good at you know, looking to see what we can find. Again, police and fire, you know, thank God those guys can really help us out and, and inspect their own vehicles and find them because they're doing a great job over there. Um, the other stuff, trailers, those are easy to get still. Some of the um, heavy duty equipment, the excavator, um, even the roadside mower, those could be six, eight months out, but they're still in the same model year. I do feel like we've bought a lot of vehicles we, in the last couple of years. How, last, what did, how many vehicles do we have in our fleet? Uh, 300s, roughly, between trailers, trucks, fire trucks, police cars, I don't know. Um, so we have 300 vehicles and 274 employees in the city. Mm -hmm. And last I checked, I don't think our clerks are driving vehicles and other people of that nature. So I'm sure there's a mm -hmm. lot of people that don't. Well, um, it's not just vehicles, it's specialized equipment. When you okay. have to have excavators, you have to have backhoes, you have to have front end loaders to load your salt. You have to have skid steers to move dirt around. You have to have, and that's even police and fire. I mean, they, they're they smart trailers in that inventory. That's not just vehicles. Okay. Our equipment is equipment. It's every piece of equipment we own. It could be the generators. It, so yeah. again, we also had several years where the city was um, struggling when we had the downturn and we didn't buy vehicles and that put us so far behind. Uh, when we start not buying vehicles again and replacing things that are wore out, then you get behind again, you have to play catch up. Are we good about actually getting rid of the vehicles that we say we Every, should get rid of? Everything that is on the replacement has been gone. And we did really well at the last couple auctions, so. We'll continue to do that, and there's also times when we can trade vehicles in. We try to cost, average it out. You know, we look at the, the market on what we're getting on the trade, and I'm looking ahead at the auctions. I have a really good relationship with the auction. 
what is a vehicle of this nature getting? If they're going to give me two thousand dollars trade in, but I call the auction, they're saying, "Hey, we're seeing three or four thousand. I'm sent the auction myself. I'm not going to the dealer. Money goes back to the general fund and gets redistributed." Any other questions for Mr. Brooker on this? I know I had several. Mr. Lattermo. Yeah. So I uh, guess I share some of Ms. Harrison's concerns. And looking at the list of vehicles by department that I received, I think yeah, we've got quite a few vehicles based on department. Um, and with some of the we were back on Mr. Real and myself for on council when we started buying a lot of vehicles because that wasn't done. And I thought we did a pretty good job mm -hmm. getting everything up to speed. And I'd say it looks like uh, some of this stuff may, uh, I'm going to scrutinize, I guess, vehicles a lot closer going forward. And I do have questions. Uh, the stump grinder and urban forestry the pickup with the, the one-time dump with the plow, for as often as urban forestry would need a dump truck, there's not another service vehicle that they could use for the dump truck. At any given time, all of the smaller dump trucks are out at one time. We don't have a full fleet of small vehicles, uh, the dump, small dump trucks. We have a decent-sized fleet of large dump trucks, but they're not, you don't use them for stump grinders and stuff like that. Okay, so I go, so we're looking at a, a dump truck Mm -hmm. stump grinder at a hundred and some thousand wouldn't it be more efficient especially considering the employees time and that to just contract out stump grinding no i don't think so really i don't think so i think if you want to start going cost average out i think there's a lot of things we could we could pick at but everything on this list is a wish list there's many times we've cut these lists I'm not saying we're going to buy everything on here there's some things that we might be able to put off for another year the one ton dump truck we're replacing is replacing a 1997 truck. That truck came from the fire department. That was a truck we repurposed. That truck has 150, 200,000 miles on it. Don't know too many people driving the 200,000 mile truck on a daily basis. So we are not asking for anything over and above what needs replaced. I mean, we have a lot of equipment. And again, you're right, we have more equipment than people. But when the citizens need something done with a dump truck, we got to make sure it's there. If they we're plowing streets, we got to make sure those plow trucks are available. For the size of our city, the amount of plow trucks we have is probably less than a city in our size. We have a good maintenance facility. We have a good bunch of guys that actually work on our trucks. About 11 plow trucks for the amount of roads we plow is probably small compared to another city of our size. So we are not over. We're not adding vehicles. Again, everything's replacement. Um, again, I know several of you have been down and walked through the facility. I'll take anybody through any day they want, and I'd be more than happy to show you why we're replacing vehicles. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Mr. Berger. And I know we talked earlier, too, about the performance audit in the city and the fleet assessment was one of those things on there, and I think it would be good to compare. And they said that's what they do, compare to cities of similar size. And so I think if, if you know, we feel that way that we have less than other cities, it would be a good comparison to have somebody come in and do that assessment. I think that's all for item C, unless anybody else has any other questions. We have one last item for that, item D, Mr. Brooker, which I believe is our capital improvements list for buildings. Thank you. I think Mr. Wren sent um, something out earlier this week or at the end of last week to touch on this. Again, I apologize for him not being here. Um, a lot of these things are just uh, some repairs and some a few upgrades to the uh, to the building itself and um, a couple of other items. Some of the things that you know we see on here, the VAV retrofit, we spent money last year on that to take everything we had that we could and rebuild. And it we're to the point now that the parts aren't even available, so that's why that's a little higher on the cost. Um, safety buildings has a lot of issues over there with with their heating and air and, and doing stuff like that is trying to just keep the, the building to the best shape it can. A um, couple things that are covered, like fire station upgrades are covered under the levy. Uh, the vehicle lifts um, over at the service department are have been in there since the building was built and um, a couple of them have currently failed OSHA inspections. We can't use them anymore. Those are the ones that the guys are standing underneath when a plow truck comes in and needs work done on it. We can't have the uh, 
um, equipment like that failing and, and injuring an, uh, an employee. So these aren't wish list items. These are uh, items that really need to be looked at for the safety and uh, continuing work of the uh, equipment and keep everything in the best shape possible. Pretty much everything self-explanatory what uh, is on here. I'll do the best I can on anything that needs answered. Um, again, I was given this at the last minute because we thought Mr. Wren would actually maybe be back today, but um, unfortunately that didn't happen. So if there's any other questions, I'll, I'll work through them as best as I can. Any questions for Mr. Brooker on these items? Mr. Feldman. Thank you, Ms. Harrison. And this may be for the mayor. I, I like eight three-sided electronic signboard, front yard of City Hall, um, but we need to make sure it's, I mean, when you start talking digital signs, it's how close those little LEDs are, right? And the closer they are, the more expensive they are. Um, three signs, I'm just trying to configure it, Mr. Mayor. I, We're, this is mine, Mr. Feldman. Okay. Um, I actually, I'm working with the same company that did the one at the high school. So your sign at the high school, um, your digital sign out front is pretty much, the, it's the same company that did that. So she knows what we're looking for, something of that quality, actually a little bigger. The reason we're looking at a three-sided sign is look at our intersection. There's no way we can per put a sign out there that shows just the way the configuration of this, of this corner is to show residents driving up and down the road without having accidents, trying to read the sign. So we're looking at it to face both Graham and 91, but again, also face in towards the intersection when people are sitting there. Um, it's a little expensive. Uh, this is just the planning stages of it. I mean, the company said that the size of sign, they haven't done anything that large of on the pre-standing on the ground. They've also done um, oh, Canal Park or whatever it's called now. They did the, their big signs down there. So the lady I talked to, some really informative. She gave me a lot of information. Uh, we are gonna meet here in the near future. She was coming up with some design concepts or even the, the whatever's gonna be put around the outside of the sign, whether it's stone or brick or some kind of veneer. But it will be a, um, a good size sign out there so things are actually readable. As you know, anytime we have an event, we're pulling signs up into the front yard. Where those message boards we put up there are just that. They're short, small construction message boards. They're not meant to have all the graphics and everything. This would just enhance anytime we promote something within the city. Yeah, I, and I agree. I'm not, I'm, I'm not adversarial. I, we need a sign in the front, Absolutely. right? But I guess what I'm saying is, let's make sure it's high quality yeah. because and that's those why LEDs got to be close to oh each yeah. other. And, and that's <laughs> the readability why, of it. The, uh, I mean, so this this company seems really top notch. And again, she showed me some examples. And one the first thing popped up was the Stowe Motor Falls High School sign, and uh, I think that's a nice sign. And, so they've done really well as far as we cheaped ours examples. a little bit. You need a better one. Than nah. ours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember approving that, Mr. <laughs> Feldman, when we were on. And uh, I know there's, I mean, it's no secret, the lettering's too small yes. when you drive by. Yeah. So that's one of those things that we were looking at with this. People yeah. will be able to read it. Now we're not going to blind them, but right. it'll, it'll be, be similar, but it'll be bigger. Yeah. And, we, and we're okay on zoning, right? <laughs> that's, that's a joke. Thanks, Ms. Yeah. Harrison. <laughs> Um, also, too, because we're also having issues, as you all know, of communicating <clears throat> with our residents. Ms. Narstead will tell you that, um, you know, you look at Stowe Century, you look at Dubuque Journal, um, how are people getting their information? And it, it seems weird that we're going back to times that we have to put signs, uh, but it will look better than, say, the banner type signs out there. Uh, but what we have learned from those banner type signs is that people do read them. So we know that people will at least get information up there. So uh, we're figuring this is at least probably the best shot right now to get information out to residents. Mr. McIntyre. Uh, <clears throat> I have two questions and one's kind of a follow up with the electronic signs. I know Mayor has spent a lot of time since uh, a, a city of our size and, and what we're trying to accomplish that we're putting four by eight sheets of plywood out there to communicate things that are going on in our city. It's tacky, not only tacky, but it's just, it, it does it shows that we're not progressing as a city the second thing is is I guess are these signs going to meet the, the, the zoning code because I know the issues that we've had with these signs is that they oversize you know, to, again we're back to the zoning and that's not a question that needs to be answered today because obviously we don't know exactly what the sign looks like um, but going into zoning code we have a zoning code update here and I spoke with mr. Wren the other day about this I I personally am not going to support 
piece of legislation that comes before council to just give blanket authority to go changing our zoning code. Zone code provided us that document. So my goal next year as, as, a, as a member of council would be to take that document and sit down and look at, because there are pieces and parts of our zoning code that are good and clearly we heard residents today say there's parts that were bad. Uh, but we really need to look at it before we just say we're gonna go and rewrite. I know I said we do need to do some rewrites and I absolutely stand behind that, but we need to do it in a really uh, a structured manner and not just say, here, go do this for us. Um, and then the last one, the vehicle lift replacements. I didn't, I, Mr. Burker, this is a question for you. I thought that we were more governed by the Ohio Industrial Commission and not OSHA. So I'm just curious as how OSHA came in here and failed these as an inspection. We have a, a party that comes in and does our inspections. They use an OSHA standard when they do our inspections. It's not OSHA. The party that does our inspections for our equipment, our vehicle lifts, has to use an OSHA standard. That's what they work off of. And they failed two pieces of equipment. They will not work on it and they will not certify it. And that's fine. That's, I just want to make sure that it's not OSHA that's in here failing our thing. Because that's just, the, that was the impression I got. That's all the questions I had. Thank you. Any other questions on item D? Mr. Latimer. A um, couple, uh, since you're discussing the lift, what are we doing now? So I'm saying. Well, it's not being used. We're using one lift to do all of our equipment. We have one large lift instead of two. But we actually have three. Two of the three are down right now. So everything has to be done on one large lift. So it's really stretching the time that we can and the efficiency of get, actually getting our work done. We have went actually back to using large um, stands and guys laying underneath vehicles with large, uh, for more safe jack stands. So how quickly do you think you're going to get these lifts um, approved? If we can get them approved, it, they should be in the first quarter. It's not a nice way. No, it's unfortunately, yeah. Maintenance or somebody and we, that can right, and we're looking at upgrading from the old in-ground style lift, which rots out, which is what everybody's finding, to more of the remote style, um, picks the vehicles up by the wheels and you have, you know, everything's on top of the concrete instead of underground. You don't have to worry about things rotting out, laying in the salt water. Unfortunately, nature of our business here, everything's covered in salt water in the winter. And the um, city hall redesign, it, what, that's, what is? that's the whole front entrance out here. We're looking to kind of come up with a concept of what would work better out front what's more appealing, what's more inviting to the citizens other than a, a sea of concrete. Oh, like a flower bed? Or Everything. The whole thing from, from the driveway up to the front of the building. All that concrete and just figure out what's going to flow better out front and what's, again, more appealing and sound. Incorporating the memorial? Metal, and right, the, right. The memorial is there. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Brooker, I think we replaced the vehicle lift last year or repaired one, correct? I'm sorry? I think there was a vehicle la lift last year that came up that needed replaced or repaired. Is that correct? We did one of the smaller ones last year, okay. correct. And we actually, luckily on that one, we were able to retrofit a lot of things on it um, and saved us some money. But these, unfortunately, are our in-ground large lifts. That's where they're, uh, they're definitely a little pricey. But they've been in there since the building was built. All right, any other items for Finance Committee tonight? Mr. McIntyre. One last question. On the redesign entrance of City Hall, and I may have over, have we gone out to get any design on this yet? Because I thought I saw the bill listing where we consulted a design consultant with that area. Uh, I believe so. I'm and not involved with that again. When do we anticipate getting the findings from that designer? Should be by mid-January. Mid-January? Thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none, we now come to the time for public comment before the Finance Committee. If there's anybody who wishes to make a pub public comment, please raise your hand and be recognized. Doesn't look like we have any public comments. I will make a motion to adjourn. Second. Moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 We stand adjourned. Too hard. <laughs> Remember the flyer? You did?
My name is Kyle Feldman. I'd like to call to order the Roads and Safety Committee meeting uh, for December 15th at 9.28 p.m. Uh, first item is roll call. Mr. Loudermilk? Here. Mr. McIntyre? Here. Mr. Real? Present. And all other council members are present. Uh, next item is approval of minutes from our 12-1-22 Roads and Safety Committee meeting. Moved to approve. Second. It's been moved and second. All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 No opposed. All right, city officials reports. Item number four on the agenda. Police chief. Thank you, sir. Uh, I do not have a report, but I would like to thank everybody that uh, contributed to the Chop of the Cop. We had that this past weekend. We had 10 departments and we had 201 children. Uh, it was a phenomenal event. So for everybody that bought a ticket or came out and helped, I am very appreciative of that. Uh, it, it, it went very well. Also, uh, last week we had two vehicles stolen out of driveways uh, due to key fobs being left in the vehicles and the vehicles being unlocked. Just remind our community members and citizens that uh, get those key fobs <laughs> out of your cars and lock your vehicles. And lastly, uh, because it is the Christmas time and a lot of gifts are being put uh, deliveries are being put on porches. Make sure that uh, you do everything you can to get those off the porches as quickly as possible to prevent thefts. And with that, I'll answer any questions. Thank you, Chief Film. Um, I, I want to tell you, a privilege to attend the Shop of the Cop. Um, hadn't been to one at Kimpton. I attended the one at the high school because I'm always there, but um, the one at Kimpton was excellent. And it was uh, neat seeing all those kids and how they're treated for that day. So. Kudos to you, and uh, we host that here, and um, and it was neat to see all the different police departments that were there. So, right. questions for Chief Phil, Mr. McIntyre. I would say yeah, Shop and Cop. I was at the uh, up at the Shopping Plaza when it all came in, and I know uh, there was a lot of chatter that there was an apocalypse coming across the city because <laughs> nobody could understand why there was all these department police cars and everything else. But uh, I know it was a successful event. And, Kudos to those who participated. Kudos to all the police officers that uh, participated. So. Thank you. And also uh, to Target. I mean, they, they did a great job with their personnel. They, they keep us in certain aisles uh, lined so we stay out of the public's way. And I, too, have received a lot of comments from just citizens out shopping uh, about the program. So, yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Phil. Fire Chief, Chief Stone. Thank you, Mr. Feldman. Uh, Two things that we have coming up in our future is uh, uh, Firefighter Mel has organized his Shop with a Hero on uh, Saturday morning with the uh, across the street from Target at Meyer. So not, we're, we won't be nearly the scale that the uh, police department had, and we won't cause a traffic jam that I got stuck in on Saturday. But uh, <laughs> but it's a good program also that we're real happy about. But uh, they did a fantastic job. I did see their, their video online. The other thing we have is uh, the next uh, meeting, I believe, uh, in January the 12th is our fire safety poster contest meeting, or winners will be brought here, and so we're looking forward to presenting them to you. And uh, and uh, Mel will be doing her program, I think, usually it's at 6 o'clock or 6.30, I think, and uh, so we'll be doing that uh, next month, I think January 12th. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chief Stone. Any questions for Chief Stone? Mr. McIntyre. The, the fire poster is first on the agenda. Pardon me? The poster award ceremony is was Fantastic. The first, you want their first on the agenda. <laughs> In and out. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you, Chief Stone. City Engineer, Mr. McCleary. Thank you, Mr. Feldman. Um, I do not have a report, but happy to answer any questions. Questions for Mr. McCleary. All right, moving along. Consideration of business items A, transportation capital budget discussion um, with transportation capital projects. I guess I'll shift over to Mr. Brooker, Mr. McCleary. Mr. McCleary? Got it. Thank you, Mr. Feldman. Um, this year we have quite a few projects on the list, and some are carryover projects. Uh, the first one being the Graham Fish Creek Road that was uh, bids were open last July, and because of, um, they, they got started, but getting started is ordering materials. And so they, they did very little, even though we um, started the project, uh, it takes about nine months to get traffic signal poles in. And so we expect them to come in in April or May of this year. 
The second project is the uh, Summit 91 uh, reconstruction project. The um, preliminary engineering uh, was started also in uh, 2022. And we are looking to wrap up the preliminary engineering, the preliminary environmental. All the surveying is pretty much completed. Um, the geotechnical. When move into the final design and in completing the, the environmental this year so we can get started buying right away. Next project on the list is the um, um, State Route 59 Kent Road. Uh, resurfacing. It's uh, part of a urban paving project. ODOT will be running this project and um, it's an 80-20 split. So that's for our local share. Also part of this project we received today a $150,000 grant to upgrade our curb ramps um, and that's an 80-20 split. And so that's uh, again uh, uh, a very very uh, much uh, needed down on State Route 59 along with the resurfacing. The um, signal upgrade project is for fiscal year 2025, but we'd like to get started on the engineering this year. And, and that would be by um, going out for consultant services to help design all the traffic signals, the interconnectivity, and the progressive system that'll go in replacing signals that are, some are going on 30, 33 years old. Then uh, the next project is the Stowe Bike Connector, which um, would go between uh, Silver Lake, through Co part of Coggle Falls, through Stowe to Springdale, and then work with Hudson on a joint project called Veterans Trail and at this point, uh, we received an update. Both Tom Sheridan and I talked to Metro RTA today. And at, that t at this time, Metro RTA has to get approval to move forward from the Federal Transit Authority, the Federal Transit Board, the Federal Railroad Administration, and CSX. So, so we have to jump uh, a lot of hurdles through all these different areas so that we can move forward with the bike trail projects. Um, uh, AMATS has sent out a letter understanding that some of these approvals may take a little time and they have said that the funding will stay in place. And so that's $700,000 grant for both the uh, the bike connector south of Springdale and uh, $700,000 uh, grant for Hudson Stowe. And then the last project uh, on the list is the Kings Mill Bike Trail Connectivity. This is a project that was highly rated in the uh, connectivity grant that AMETS did last summer. So um, we'd like to get started on uh, getting that built over the summer this, this year. Happy to answer any questions. Just a quick follow up, Mr. McCleary. The, the email you sent to task force, which we was sent, the, can you just clarify that? Because I tried to understand it and what we said to them. Does that have to do with six or no? That That's separate, right? The information from Mr. CP of task, task force. So we gave him an update of what we knew at that time. Which and, is, which and is what? We got a, which pretty much is reflected again today from uh, the Metro RTA that they have to work through the Federal Transit Authority and the different agencies that all are stakeholders. Too many of them. Yeah. Would you say there's like four agencies under that FTA that you just indicated? I think you just noted like four different ones that need approval. Is CSX, is that because the rail line is over like in Coggle Falls? The RTA parallels that CSX line. Is that why uh, they need I, to it, That was the first time I've heard about CSX was today. I mean, that's the only but, I but I guess when the um, it was transferred 20, 25 years ago from CSX to um, the yeah, uh, Metro RTA, there was some kind of uh, agreement that if it ever changed hands, they have to get approval again to, ch you know, they, they held on to some, I do not know the 
particulars on how they wrote the agreement, but Metro RTA pointed out that they do have uh, a review process that they have to go through. Other questions for Mr. Cleary? Yes, Mr. Magda. Uh, thank you. So obviously at the siting that State Route 59 that's going to be resurfaced, uh, the curb ramp, that's going to be in conjunction with this, just a different source of funding. Is that is that is, is that going to be one project that's going on? It, it'll time? be one project we're working with ODOT. Um, we've already started the project. Um, we have it surveyed, engineered in-house, and we have already submitted the uh, the design to ODOT for their final approval, and they're going to include it in the urban paving project that goes out to bid this uh, June. Okay, and then the uh, so paving July. That's what that's looking construction start date pardon me the, the July date here is more for the start of the actual work uh, they are in the fiscal uh, year 2024 first quarter so it, we're hoping that so it's one of the very first projects so for, the, the projects designed so they want to bid it out so they can award in July and get it paved this year and for those who are listening ODOT fiscal year is July to July so July of 23 starts the fiscal year 24 so everyone just kind of understands how ODOT's fiscal years work. Uh, the curb compliance and curb ramps, uh, where, where's the, I guess this might be for the finance, where are we intending paying that portion of money from? Our, our share. Does it have anything to do with sidewalks? I'm assuming it's coming from the sidewalk repair fund it, because- that, that was our intent. I mean, obviously yeah. that program says that a certain amount needs to go to ADA compliance curb ramps. Yeah. So is that where you're intending yes. to pay for that from? Okay. And then the Stowe Bike Connector Veterans Trail, obviously, that's a long, obviously it's a discussion. It's, it's, it's really, we're at the mercy of the federal government at this point. Is that a fair statement that, to make? That is correct. But AMAP is saying we're not gonna lose the funding. That is correct. They have sent an email saying that they sent it to Hudson and all the stakeholders and the task force that we will not lose the funding. And in your professional understanding how these agencies work, would you anticipate any of these approvals being done in the annual year 23? The reason I'm asking that is because yeah. of how slow this is going, that that $250,000 be used for something else instead of possible engineering for a project that we're not gonna lose funding on in the future. Um, based on past- you have another project that you could use $250,000. Based on uh, past dealings with uh, different agencies, it's not a quick process. Nobody knows how long it is. They've already had discussions with uh, FTA um, they had discussions with, um, yeah, it's after the discussing with uh, Metro Park um, director today, uh, she's in told us the extra effort where they'll have to get a final approval from CSX, the Federal Railroad Administration, and the, uh, it, it, it will drag out. I, I would be highly unlikely that we will be able to start by the end of the year. So we could say, let's comfortably say no and be excited when they say yes, right? Kind of deal. <laughs> no surprises if it happens, but more likely it won't. I, we would be surprised, correct. Okay. It would be uh, um, unusual that it happened that quickly, but. So my uh, question is for $250,000 that you're looking at for just possible engineering, is there anything else that we could use to do some possible engineering on in 2023? We, we could use it on other projects and, and as AMATS is, you know, is not, not they're, they're holding that those projects, both Hudson's and Stowe's, as a placeholder for the TASA funding. Is this $250,000 in any way related to that money? No, this is to get the projects designed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McNair. Any other questions? Mr. Long. Yeah, Jim, on the uh, Veterans Trail, the 250000 so that's just the engineering. That would be just the start of the engineering. I can't say, you know, because right now it would be the preliminary engineering, you know, because we're looking at about three and a half miles now. And you, you mentioned that it's also including Silver Lake and Call the Falls, correct? Well, there's two projects. One, one project, uh, Stowe is the lead, and that starts at Springdale Road and goes south across Graham Road, through part of Chicago Falls, into Silver Lake, going to the uh, pedestrian bridge that crosses Route 8. 
And, and then there's a second project that was recently funded last year, and that's from Barlow Road in Hudson to Springdale Road in Stowe. And so there's two different projects. The one in the north is more expensive than the one in the south. Okay, and this is simply the engineering cost for the Stowe portion of the project? This would be the engineering cost for the Stowe portion. The other Correct. cities, I assume, have similar? And, and, and it would also be part of, the, part of the share because we are going to try to coordinate the engineering at the same time. Thank you. Other questions for Mr. McCleary? All right. Thank you, Mr. McCleary. Appreciate your list. Um, we'll move on to item B. Um, discussion of 2022-200, the annual road plan. That item moved out of committee at, on Monday's meeting after the council for a first reading. Say it again? That, that ordinance we moved out of roads and oh. safety for a first reading. So it's actually on the council agenda for a first reading. It's that's right, we did it at the committee meeting. Um, just to give everybody a, a brief update, we met on, uh, what day was that? Monday. Monday. Um, had a great discussion about ratings, talked to Mr. Um, Mr. Anderson, Mr. Brooker, um, and how we can work together to get where um, this legislation is going to help all of us. and. Um, and, and really get our road program uh, on some solid timeline footing and with a five-year plan and continuous with us with a consistent rating so uh, any other comments on that meeting from uh, committee members of roads and safety yes mr. Robin so I see a version one are you version mr. one is the one, version one is the one that moved on to council that includes the amendments we discussed. Those, yes, those are the, um, no, there's the, the amendments, no, there has, version one was the one we moved on. Okay, the amendments that we discussed haven't been talked about. I know Mr. Renner reached out to me. I mean, I'm looking to, there's some things, concerns Mr. Ren still has. So for me, I would just put it on for, it would be my recommendation as the one who introduced it to just have it as a first reading tonight at council. Yeah, sounds good. Cause, uh, uh, and I'll get back to Mr. Laudermuk. I also had a small thing in there that I'd like to add about, and I was gonna speak to, Committee members individually on setting a goal. If we had a rating yeah. now, we can you know work with consultants. So yeah. no, I would we're agree. all doing. I thought that was a great discussion we had. Probably should have a lot more of those in the future. But the uh, yeah, I just want to make sure that we capture the amendments that we discussed. Yeah. So uh, Mr. McIntyre, we'll 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 move it on for a first reading, and then uh, we'll go from there and talk through before January. Um, 12th, 15th, whatever that date is, and uh, we'll make some amendments. All right, anything else uh, for roads and safety? At this time, anybody wishing to make a public comment may come forward, state your name and address, and make your public comment. Any roads and safety public comments? Chairman? Yes. Do we need a motion to move this on this evening? We moved it on. on we moved it at the committee. Oh, we did. Okay. Thank you. Seeing none, uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Moved and second. All those in favor, please signify by saying yes. 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 We stand adjourned. We have a minute here to get the computer restarted here for the next meeting. I call to order the city council meeting of December 15th, 2022 to order and ask the clerk to please call the roll. McIntyre? Here. Real? Present. Yoka? Here. Feldman? Here. Rakat? Here. Harrison? Here. Lotto? Here. All right, now we have our prayer and pledge of allegiance this evening offered by Ward 4 Councilman Mario Fields. Please bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we come to you today asking for your guidance, wisdom, and support as we begin this meeting. Help us to engage in meaningful discussion. Allow us to grow closer as a group and nurture a 
Great, the next item up is proclamations and commendations. To my knowledge, we have no proclamations and commendations this evening. Uh, so the next item up is the approval of minutes. We do have two sets of minutes. The first is uh, I would like to make a motion to approve the minutes from the public hearing of November 10, 2022. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 No's, abstentions, those minutes are approved. I now make a motion to approve the December 1st, 2022 council meeting minutes. Second. So moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. No's, abstentions, those minutes stand approved. All right, next up is public comments. Uh, now comes the time in the meeting where we ask for comments from the audience. Should you wish to make any comments, please raise your hand and be recognized by the president of council. Please provide your name and address for the benefit of our clerk because your comments will become part of the permanent record. You will be allowed Two minutes to make your comments. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to address council this evening? Okay, let the record show that no one uh, has raised their hand to speak. Uh, we do have some, there was some requests for uh, things to be read at city council meeting and pursuant to the council rules. Those uh, requests will be included in the meeting minutes as if being read. Okay, so that closes the public comment portion of the meeting. Uh, next up is Mayor Report. Mayor Pabano. Thank you, Mr. McIntyre. Uh, two things, um, both of them very important. Uh, this Saturday, we have uh, Wreaths Across America, which will take uh, place in two of our cemeteries, and I invite people to come out. There's the opportunity to also help volunteer and place these wreaths. Um, it's a very touching ceremony, um, and it fits right in, really, to the holiday spirit. On a much <coughs> also too somber note, um, Bev Hurst, who works for us over in service, um, long time employee, over 40 years. Her husband passed away this week, Chuck, and uh, our condolences go out to uh, both uh, Bev and her family at this time. So uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, questions for Mayor Fabano. All right, seeing none, we will move on to old business. Is there any old business to come before council this evening? Is there any new business to come before council this evening? Uh, we do have one item that came out of executive session, but still. I'd like to introduce ordinance number 22-211 and ask the clerk to please read it by its title. An ordinance amending ordinance number 2019-95, which appointed the position of clerk of council by changing the position of clerk of council from full-time to part-time, establishing the terms and compensation and declaring an emergency. All right, I'd like to uh, move to suspend the rules. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded to suspend the rules. All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 No's, abstentions, the rules are suspended. I move to adopt. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt. Further discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll. McIntyre? Yes. Real? Yes. Fioka? Yes. Goldman? Yes. Akai? Yes. Harrison? Yes. Loudon? Yes. Okay, ordinance number 22-211 has been adopted and will take effect according to its terms. Uh, is there any other new business? Mayor Probonik, I know at the Committee of the Whole there was discussion of potentially, do you have any other recommendations that you'd like to make this evening? Not at this time, but uh, if we could possibly look at our organizational meeting, if that would be okay with you, think about that. I would certainly... Have uh, that oh, yes, I mean, the next, next Wednesday will be the deadline, so if you have some... If you'd like to, I would have no problem with putting it at the organization. We've taken up business at the organizational meeting too, and obviously. Okay. So yes, we'll some, definitely meet that deadline. Yes, the, the noon deadline will be for tomorrow or uh, next week. So. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Any other new business to come before council this evening? All right. Seeing none, we will move on to the disposition of ordinances and resolutions. Uh, the first item is the annual appropriation, which, if you do recall, was put on the table at our last meeting. I'd make a motion to remove item number 2022-164 from the table. Second. It's been moved and seconded to remove 22-164 from the table. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 No's, abstentions. 
Property. 22-164 is off the table. I would make a motion to adopt ordinance number 22-164. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt 22-164. Further discussion on this item? Mr. Pierce. Mr. McIntyre, I, I apologize to everybody for us running so late tonight as we are finishing up our budget items. I'm hoping as we go into next year, we can plan a little earlier and maybe we won't be doing everything at the last meeting here in December as we work on a better budgeting process. Thank you. Thank you. I know, thank you, Ms. Harrison. I know I've spoken with Mr. Earl and Mr. Costello in terms of capital improvement. They're working on the finance component of that. I spoke with Mr. Wren. Mayor Probonik, I know they're working on, I talked with uh, Mr. Wren, obviously with the new way things go uh, in terms of the form and speaking with Mr. Wren, hopefully we can have some sort of form template of what the administration is going to propose to pr pr present it to council next year. And so that way council says, hey, yes, here it is. And then there's no, here's the budget. We don't like the way it forms. So that's kind of the process I've been working through with Mr. Wren. Uh, so I, I agree, obviously working with Mr. Wren too to try to establish um, a better budget schedule calendar of when things are going to be due in the year. Any other further discussion regarding this? Will the clerk please call the roll? McIntyre? Yes. Real? Yes. Yoga? Yes. Feldman? Yes. McKay? Yes. Harrison? Yes. Bottomer? Yes. Okay, ordinance number 22-164 has been adopted and will take effect according to its terms. And now uh, item B remains in committee. Now I'd like to do, I think we tabled the next item as well, or no? Did that just get a second reading? Yeah, tabled. Okay, so. I make a motion to remove ordinance number 22-181 from the table. Second. It's been moved and seconded to remove 22-181 from the table. All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 No's, abstentions, that is off the table. <coughs> I'd move to adopt ordinance 22-181. Second. Been moved and seconded to adopt 22-181. Is there further discussion? Mr. Pierce. Um, Mr. McIntyre, I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Earl, I know we've talked about the ARPA funds and this is reallocating funds for the 2022 year. Uh, I'd like to hopefully work in what we would like to spend next year on those instead of waiting till the end of the budget year. If we could work on that as we start approving capital projects and start getting that legislation. If we could do that as we move through that process. I know right now we haven't earmarked anything in the budget presentations we have, but I'm assuming there'll be items for 2023 as well. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I think as we, uh, really, like I said, when we got the budget so far, we haven't seen anything earmarked for ARPA funds, but as we get legislation, um, let's make sure that we're doing that as we go instead of cleaning up here at the end of the year. Thank you. Uh, just so for clarification, this only had a first reading, so. I would move to suspend the rules for ordinance 22-184. Second. It's been moved and seconded to suspend the rules. All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 No's, abstentions, the rules are suspended. Move to adopt. Second. Yes. It's been moved and seconded to adopt. Further discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? McIntyre? Yes. Real? Yes. Yoka? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Mackay? Yes. Harrison? Yes. Bottomer? Yes. 22 181 has been adopted. It will take effect according to its terms. 22 189 remains in committee. Uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, ordinance number 22 200, and I'd like to introduce that and ask the clerk to please read it by its title for a first reading. Order. An ordinance establishing Chapter 903, codified ordinance of Stowe, entitled Annual Road Plan and Declaring an Emergency. All right, that will constitute its first reading. The next item up is, uh, this is a capital improvement plan, uh, item ordinance number 22-201. I'd like to introduce uh, ordinance 22-201 and ask the clerk to please read it by its title. An ordinance establishing chapter 119 codified ordinances of Stowe entitled capital improvement plan and declaring an emergency. All right, that uh, is the second. Is there any, is there any, does anyone have any discussion on this, this item or anything along those lines regarding I mean, if there's no further discussion, obviously, as I'd indicated previously, this is this this uh, codified ordinance is meant to be the guiding document for not only council but future administrations on developing that that long-term capital vision for the city of Stowe and allowing them, you know, kind of walk them through how to prioritize projects. Uh, so, if there isn't any discussion, I would make a motion to suspend the rules. 
Second. So moved and seconded to suspend the rules. All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 No. Abstentions. The rules are suspended. I move to adopt. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt. Further discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? McIntyre? Yes. Real? Yes. Yoka? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Kakat? Yes. Harrison? Yes. Love. Yes. Great. Ordinance number 22 201 has been adopted. It will take effect according to its terms. The next item up, I believe, is for you, Mr. Harrison. Thank you, Mr. McIntyre. I would like to introduce ordinance number 2022-202 and ask the clerk to please read it by its title. An ordinance authorizing the mayor to make an heir to a contract with Summit County Department of Sanitary Sewer Services without the necessity of public bid to provide sewer services to all city facilities for the calendar year of 2023. Move to suspend the rules. Second. It's been moved and seconded to suspend the rules. All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 No's abstentions. The rules are suspended. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt. Further discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? McIntyre? Yes. Real? Yes. Yoka? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Okay? Yes. Harrison? Yes. Love? Yes. Good. Ordinance 22 202 has been adopted. will take effect according to its terms. I'd like to introduce ordinance number 22 203 and ask the clerk to please read it by its title. An ordinance authorizing an expenditure for the fleet repair and maintenance of vehicles for the fire department from vendor Clayton Ford Lincoln Incorporated for the calendar year 2022 and declaring an emergency. Move to suspend the rules. Second. It's been moved and seconded to suspend the rules. All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 No's abstentions. The rules are suspended. Move to adopt. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt. Further discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? McIntyre? Yes. Real? Yes. Yoka? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Lakai? Yes. Harrison? Yes. Love? Yes. Ordinance number 22 203 has been adopted. We'll take effect according to its terms. I'd like to introduce Ordinance 22 204 and ask the clerk to please read it by its title. An ordinance amending the annual appropriation ordinance 2021 185, which provides funds for the expenses of the City of Stowe for the year 2022 and all amendments and supplements thereto and declaring an emergency. Move to suspend the rules. Second. It's been moved and seconded to suspend the rules. All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 No's abstentions, the rules are suspended. Move to adopt. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt. Further discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll. McIntyre? Yes. Real? Yes. Yoka? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Lakai? Yes. yes. Harrison? Yes. Love. Yes. Ordinance 22-204 has been adopted. will take effect according to its terms. I'd like to introduce Ordinance 22-205 and ask the clerk to please read it by its title. An ordinance authorizing the transfer of funds between various funds for 2022 and declaring an emergency. Move to suspend the rules. Second. It's been moved and seconded to suspend the rules. All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 No's abstentions. The rules are suspended. Move to adopt. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt. Further discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? McIntyre? Yes. Real? Yes. Yoka? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Okay? Yes. Harrison? Yes. Bottom up? Yes. Good. Ordinance 22 205 has been adopted. will take effect according to its terms. I'd like to introduce ordinance number 22 206 and ask the clerk to please read it by its title. An ordinance amending ordinance 2008 128, commonly known as the general payroll ordinance, and all amendments thereto, particularly section 4.01 thereof, to provide or revised mayor med major medical hospitalization life insurance and dental coverage and provisions and declaring an emergency. Move to suspend the rules. Second. It's been moved and seconded to suspend the rules. All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 No's abstentions. The rules are suspended. Move to adopt. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt. Further discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? McIntyre? Yes. Real? Yes. Yoka? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Lakai? Yes. Harrison? Yes. Love? Yes. Great. Ordinance number 22-206 has been adopted. will take effect according to its terms. Uh, item 207, 22-207 and 22-208 uh, remained in committee. And the next item up is for Mr. Zuliker. I'd like to introduce item 22-209 and ask the uh, clerk to read it by its title. 
A resolution approving a CVC of Peggy Feeders applicant on behalf of Teammate Center LLC to permit the operation of an adult daycare facility located at 3099 Graham Road in the city of Stowe. Move to suspend the rules. Second. We move and second it to suspend the rules. All those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 No's abstentions. The rules are suspended. We do adopt. Second. We moved and seconded to adopt. Further discussion? Discussion. Mr. Coleman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Saracen, <clears throat> maybe this was for you, Mr. Cowan. So conditional use, I get it. Adult daycare, there's no code requirements for the inside of this building? Um, any interior requirements would be regulated by the building department or for adult daycares through the state, if they have any requirements for that as well. Uh, wouldn't fall into the zoning requirements. Okay, so is that a yes or no? For interior requirements, <laughs> right? Well, I'm, I mean, they're gonna use it, I understand, and I'm in favor of the use, but I've been in that building, and if you're gonna have a bunch of people who, I mean, is there any bathroom requirements, ADA accessibility, and all those things are, are, are part of the building approval? Um, sure there are. Uh, this, that's all the purview of the zoning code. So there aren't any zoning code requirements for interior alterations. Um, but again, if there's any re state requirements or building requirements for those bathrooms and ADA accessible uh, appliances, that would be covered under the, under the review. This is, it's my, this is the conditional zoning certificate to utilize the space for this. But they still have to file for building permits and any, any Construction or they do in there has to meet the building requirements for yep. adult daycare facilities. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. If they do any interior alterations, they'll have to submit building permits. Yep. There's just no exterior alterations with this application, so there's no site plan review or anything like that. It's just a strictly based on the use. Mr. Riley. Yeah, just on that as well. That goes more towards uh, certificate of occupancy and then okay. state licensure as opposed to this legislation that's just for, uh, as it applies to our zoning code. So yes, but not through this legislation or through this process. Thank you, thank you, Mr. McIntyre. Thank you. <laughs> All right, further discussion. Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll. McIntyre? Yes. Real? Yes. Gioka? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Mackay? Yes. Harrison? Yes. Lattermill? Yes. Resolution 22-209 has been adopted. will take effect according to its terms. Uh, Mrs. Harrison, the last item is yours. I'd like to introduce ordinance number 22-210 and ask the clerk to please read it by its title. An ordinance authorizing an expenditure for the purchase of 10 sets of replacement turnout gear for the fire department from Municipal Emergency Services Incorporated and declaring an emergency. Move to suspend the rules. Second. Second. We moved and seconded to suspend the rules. All those in favor <coughs> signify by saying yes. 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 No's abstentions, the rules are suspended. Move to adopt. Second. We moved and seconded to adopt. Further discussion? Mr. Lattermark. Yeah, Chief, I got a question for you on, is there uh, older turnout gear that I assume we're replacing? Yes, the uh, NFPA standard requires that we replace the gear every 10 years. And this is part of our ongoing program that uh, we replace these 10 sets of gear. And so if we do this every year, Every five years, we've replaced 50 sets. Every 10 years, we've replaced 100 sets. And that, so we have a brick main set and a backup set that they have to have. And just out of curiosity, is the one we're getting rid of something that a, a smaller department or a department somewhere else might be able to use? With certain conditions, yes. Uh, yeah, Maybe we'll, we'll just leave it at that. I don't want yeah. to go in on a public record and say too much about uh, gear being used outside the NFPA standard. Yeah. But, uh, I'm Maybe sure we can that, talk about it. Yeah. Yep. I'm sure if people are need firefighting equipment, uh, we can make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? Seeing none, will the clerk please call the roll? McIntyre? Yes. Real? Yes. Gioka? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Okay? Yes. Harrison? Yes. Loudermill? Yes. Ordinance number 22-210 has been adopted. We'll take effect according to its terms. That covers all the items in the ordinance, disposition of ordinances and resolutions. Next item up is the bill listing. I move to pay the bills. Second. We moved and seconded to pay the bills. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying yes. 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 No's, abstentions, the bills are paid. Mr. Costello, are you gonna need anything between now and the end of the year? For, uh, for 
council, we don't need a council signature. For we don't need approval of a future bill listing. Okay. All right, just want to make sure. All right, scheduling of uh, pending committees. This will be for the first meeting, our first meeting, the 12th? The 12th. 12th of January. Uh, obviously, uh, <coughs> council leadership may change at the organizational meeting with, on the, the third. So obviously, uh, the current chairs of each committee, if you want to schedule a pending committee meeting for the 12th, then if and when the chairs change, then the chair <coughs> can make a change at that time. So public improvements, Mr. Loudermill. I don't believe there's a need at this time. All right, planning, Mr. Fioka. Uh, yes, go ahead, put one on. Always. Finance, roads and safety, Mr. Yes, Feldman. Yes, please. All right, we'll go ahead and schedule a committee to hold for an executive session. Many items that uh, may come before us. Is there anything else to come before City Council this evening? Move to adjourn. Second. Second. Been moved and seconded to adjourn. Will the clerk please call the roll? McIntyre? Yes. Real? Yes. Yoka? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Bacut? Yes. Harrison? Yes. Loudermilk? Yes. All right, City Council stands up. <laughs>